Welcome, everybody, and good to see everybody here. And uh, so today's uh, business, the committee will consider today oral evidence from the Minister of Minister for Finance and the Permanent Secretary and the functioning of Government Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. Advise our members that we are now in public session. Uh, ask members to uh, make sure all your electronic devices, those that work, of course, are switched to mute. And make sure that if you've got any things on your screens that the cameras might be looking at that you don't particularly want us to see, so we make sure those, and I don't suspect anybody from this committee would be doing that, and have them put away, please, or switched off. Uh, I'd like to go through the, quickly through the agenda. First of all, apologies. Uh, no apologies at present, and I don't think anybody, everybody's expected to be here throughout this afternoon. And uh, remind members to declare any relevant interest, Jim. Yeah, the one on the bill. Okay. Um, Item. Uh, move on to four. the draft minute of the proceedings of the 6th of May 2020. Draft minutes of the meeting are at page 4. Past members of the. Ask members are they content that the draft minutes are accurate uh, records of proceedings? Chair, can I, um, uh, if I may, come in on the minutes? Um, uh, we seem to have agreed, and it may have been that it happened very quickly, or it may have been that. Um, uh, well, it may be, I presume it was that it happened very quickly at the end of the meeting that we agreed a letter to, am I audible, to the Infrastructure Committee regarding um, responsibility or uh, in relation to tax, compensation for taxi drivers. Um, I don't think we discussed that in any enormous detail, the content of that letter in any enormous detail. I think it's worth putting on the record and at least discussing whether it's the role of this committee to, to advise the Infrastructure Department that it's a matter for them. It's fairly clear that it isn't a matter for the infrastructure department in terms of compensating taxi drivers. They don't have any locus or competence in that matter. So I think we should reconsider whether we as a department, should, we as a committee, sorry, should be advising the infrastructure committee that it's something for the Department of Infrastructure when it isn't, basically. Um, uh, it would appear, I mean, probably it would make more sense for it to be something for the, for the economy department, given it's a sector of the economy or a sector of self-employed people who um, clearly are having difficulty, but I, I, I just wanted to put that on the record. Okay. Any comments? So I, I think it's, it's worth putting that on the record. I, I don't know if we've already sent the correspondence, Clark, um, uh, but um, I don't think we declared it. We discussed it in immense detail, but I, I just wanted to put that on the record. So noted. Okay, and apart from that, are we uh, content then for the minutes to be published on the website? Great. 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 <coughs> And uh, I will invite uh, our Minister Anne Sue Gray in, please. <coughs> Hi, Sue. Hello. Hi, Connor. Hi, yeah. Come on in. Hi. Afternoon. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, just for the record, uh, obviously this is the, the proceedings are being recorded by Hansard, and I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Connor Murphy, Minister of Finance for the Department of Finance, and Ms. Sue Gray, the Permanent Secretary from the Department of Finance. I'd like to uh, draw the members' attention to the clerk's briefing paper at page 13. The Department of Finance responds to the functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill at page 19. The list of documents referenced at the committee stage of the bill, page 33. Memo from the Committee on Standards and Privileges read the functioning of Government Bill at page 35. Letter from the Committee on Standards and Privileges to the Executive Office read the functioning of Government Bill on page 36. Minister, would you care to make an opening statement? Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to discuss this issue with yourself on the Committee. Uh, special advisors are an important part of a Minister's supporting team, as, as you will, I'm sure, be aware. And the RHI inquiry highlighted the unacceptable behaviour of some advisers passing confidential information to family members, failing to declare glaring conflicts of interest, and apparently acting out without ministerial knowledge or oversight. That's why the conduct of advisers was the focus of the five party talks that led to the new decade new approach agreement. And that's why, following the restoration of the institutions in January, I moved quickly to implement the new codes for special advisers. So these codes make clear that ministers are responsible and accountable for the management, conduct and discipline of their advisors. They require advisors to keep good records and use their official email accounts. They require advisors to publish their meetings 
with external organisation and gifts and hospitality received. They make the Department of Finance rather than the ministers responsible for setting the advisor's pay. And they cap pay level at £85,000 per year and ensure that no special advisor will be paid more than a departmental minister. I also introduced a new code of conduct and guidance for ministers as well, and as a new for enforcement arrangements in, in March. And a revised Northern Ireland Civil Service Code of Ethics has been shared with the Civil Service Commissioners and the Civil Service Unions and will be finalised as soon as possible. These changes reflect the agreement reached by five parties, and as I've set out in my clause by clause response, they address many of the issues which this bill touches on. The remaining issue is whether the breaches of the code should be a criminal offence, a matter for the police carrying the penalty of imprisonment. And this would be inconsistent with the standard practice in the public and private sectors where workplace codes of conduct are civil issue for employers, not a criminal issue for the judiciary. Importantly, it would undermine the democratic principle that ministers are responsible and accountable for the conduct of their special advisers. This responsibility would be transferred to the police and the judiciary. It's the intention of the executive to review the codes in the light of the RHI inquiry report and to make changes where the RHI inquiry has recommended improvements. And this is the primary role of the executive subcommittee described in the new decade new approach agreement. Revising rules made in legislation uh, as this bill proposes would be much harder and much slower and clearly that committee uh, has been impacted on by the COVID uh, pandemic, but it will get back to its work very quickly as soon as more normal executive business can. Connor, has the committee, subcommittee actually been formed yet? The, the, there has been an agreement to establish a subcommittee. The makeup of that committee would be from the five parties ex, uh, represented in the executive, be chaired by myself. So while they, I presume you can assume three of, and four of the five that would be on the committee, uh, we obviously have to have someone from the DUP. So uh, it, that was accepted by the executive. It hadn't actually met. Uh, and the members appointed to it. Uh, okay, and the terms of reference, I think, when our discussions last week we had with the uh, head of the civil service, he said he was going to send us a copy of the terms of reference. Okay. But yeah, he is going to do that. So just to f uh, finish, Chair, as I said, the, the revising the, the rules made in legislation is much more uh, manageable. Uh, but doing that, uh, or sorry, doing that through legislation, I think would make this process much harder and much slower. Legislation was not recommended by the RHI inquiry and is not supported by the five parties that make up the executive. So in my view, legislation is therefore at best premature. The new arrangements should be put into practice and when we complete them as a consequence of the review of the RHI inquiry recommendations uh, and should be tested before further changes are made. Thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Gentlemen. Um, I'll sort of open up as well, and this is sort of more a question of the sort of the philosophy of the issue. And last week we clearly had heard from the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. And I think we'd have to check Hansard, but I think he used the word unique about the circumstances of Northern Ireland at least three or four times. And because the bill seeks to put into primary legislation matters that are being addressed through sort of codes of conduct and guidance. There is a presupposition that there is a body of evidence and precedence to support the idea through normal practice and ethics. This should be part of the normal administration routine process that goes on within the Northern Ireland Civil Service. But the one thing we have seen, particularly around the role of special advisors, is that we have had an RHI inquiry that's shown that Northern Ireland's unique circumstances means that the normal rules didn't apply. And indeed, I think if the normal procedures of and codes of ethics had actually been followed all the way through the process, A, we would never have had a, an RHI inquiry, B, we would still have had, have had a Northern Ireland administration that was up and running, and C, because of the unique circumstances of the role of special advisors in particular, Northern Ireland isn't like any other region, indeed isn't like anywhere else in the rest of these islands. So, bearing in mind that we are in a, a situation that has been caused by the breaches both of the intent and the actuality of the rules around special advisors and what they were supposed to be doing, and also the interrelationship within special advisors of people outside government, how can you say that we should not be in a situation we should go back to what is basically a voluntary code of practice and a code of ethics, rather than putting it in a legislative process? Because Northern Ireland is unique. In some respects, we probably haven't grown up enough to have 
the standard procedures that we have elsewhere. We do need, and the people of Northern Ireland need that degree of certainty, that we're not going back to the way we were before. Minister. Well, I don't accept the argument that we're not grown up enough. I think that's a bit uh, demeaning. I remember people used that argument when we talked about the transfer of police and injustice powers, that we weren't, I think it was people from your own party actually, that we weren't grown up enough to accept these powers. It was one of the most non-contentious uh, issues that ever transferred to the Assembly's arrangements and has worked without uh, any great degree of contention since. Uh, I think you have to separate out whether, in fact, the, the rules were deficient uh, in, in relation to the previous uh, issues around special advisors, or indeed special advisors broke or bent or disregarded uh, those rules. Uh, and I wouldn't say that uh, you know, uh, the head of the civil service view that we are in unique, and I, I maybe I'll ask you to pick up. And these set of arrangements in and around ministers, special advisors, how matters can be reported on and how they can be investigated are probably unique to this institution as opposed to any other institution on these islands. Uh, so I, I would argue strongly that uh, it was the behaviour of individuals which brought the whole system into disrepute, uh, and whether rules were in legislation or not then may not have altered the fact that uh, uh, individuals behaved very disreputably. Uh, but also the fact is that we do have a much stronger set of enforcement codes and practices here now, even more so uh, than, than exists elsewhere. So perhaps yeah. Sue could Just make yeah. some reference in relation to that. So um, I think what we, what we have done, you know, with what the work that went on uh, before the formation of the executive um, with all five parties, we have developed a very strong code of conduct for special advisors. The, um, we have looked at other codes, we have taken the best of those codes, but we've actually gone further. So if I look at the, and I think the, the code of conduct that we currently have now um, is written in a, in a way that is much easier to understand, much clearer. Um, you've got in there a responsibility on uh, all special advisors to serve the executive as a whole. Uh, we're making clear the responsibility for discipline and conduct rests with the appointing minister. Um, they ha all special advisors have to sign a form to say they have accepted the terms and conditions, and they have all done that. Um, but I think, you know, we, where we've gone further is we actually say that they have got to keep accurate official records. They've got to use official accounts, email accounts, for handling information. Um, completing a declaration of interest, relevant interests will be published. Um, publish information on who special advisors are meeting externally, along with their hospitality and gifts. Um, we have you know, published the details of their salaries, their pay, going a lot further than was done here previously, and going a lot further than the other jurisdictions which, you know, where we've looked at their codes. So, I think that there is, you know, there's an awful lot in this code, and I think it was great work to do with the with the parties uh, beforehand. And you know, it, it's it's a very strong code. Mm. But, I, and again, as a question for you, Minister, you can see that the reason we got to this situation in the first place is that the way special advisors behaved, in particular, undermined fundamentally the process of government. And that was probably the main assumption of the. Uh, that was the main sort of recommendation that really comes out of what has happened around the whole RHI process. Because what has become very clear is that the real power behind Trump in many of these instances was the special advisors rather than the ministers themselves. And there is nothing in the revised code of conduct or the revised code of ethics that addresses that specific issue. Whereas the legislation that we're being invited to look at here does address those specific issues. So, again, bearing in mind the reason we're here in the first place is because of what's happened over the RHI inquiry and what happened in RHI. How do we get to the point where we prevent, by using basically a code of conduct and ethics, we do not get into the situation where, again, we have the process of the special advisors managing the ministers. Well, I think you have to be careful to make sure that that's not a sweeping statement, because that clearly was indicated to be an example in a, in a small number of cases, uh, and clearly there were only a small number of special advisors who, over the, who had operated here over the course of the previous 20 years, uh, whose behaviour was called into question, and whose, who, who the inquiry found fault 
with in terms of their individual behaviour. Uh, so this sweeping generalisation about special advisors running the place, uh, I think, doesn't flow from that. Clearly, there were issues in relation to the matters that the inquiry investigated and found uh, on. And as, as I've said, uh, part of the job that we have done is to take the work which all of the parties agreed in the five-party working groups uh, that Sue chaired, uh, and, and then put that into a, a code in relation to advisors and ministers, and then to uh, build in the potential for adding to that uh, as, as required by the inquiry's recommendations, uh, and that's what we've done. So uh, I, I would say that you know, quite clearly the behaviour of most special advisors has, been, has, has not been found to have been brought into question, uh, and questionably then whether there was code or legislation in relation to RHI, or indeed some matters before RHI where special advisors uh, were found to have been brought into disrepute and their behaviour, uh, then whether legislation would have done that or not. Clearly people have to, have to abide by the codes, but this makes clear, as Sue has said, the special advisors have responsibility to the entire executive. Uh, the ministers are now accountable and responsible, which wasn't clearly the case in, in earlier cases beyond before RHI. The ministers are accountable and responsible for the uh, advisors. Uh, I'm not sure that Sorry about that, Minister. I don't work out where that's coming from. Um, my phone's off, Char. No. I'm okay. yeah. uh, busy trying to see what's on our screens. That's what yeah. I'm asking. Clearly, the, uh, the ministers are, are uh, accountable and responsible and, and obliged to be accountable not only for the conduct but for the discipline of their special advisors. Uh, and, and as Sue said, that is a much firmer arrangement in terms of how a complaint can be made uh, in relation to the conduct of, of, uh, of a minister or the conduct of things going on in their office. That, again, is much more uh, robust than... Uh, pertains in other jurisdictions, uh, where uh, there's, there's a very strong political filter before a complaint is accepted and, and brought forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think there are, are there are a range of measures that were there, uh, and I think they have, they have been substantially improved on. I think that was the agreement of the five parties when they did look at this issue. Uh, and bear in mind, they looked at this issue uh, over the course of that work that Sue chaired uh, in the full light of the public hearings that had been heard in relation to RHI. So it wasn't blind to what, uh, it may have been blind to what the inquiry would recommend, but it certainly wasn't blind to the revelations within the inquiry uh, or the, the discussions within the inquiry about the behaviour of special advisors. Uh, and, and the recommendations were made accordingly and also, as I say, built in uh, the potential of expanding those or adding to those should the inquiry recommend that. I think just for the sake of the record, I need to declare an interest here because I was very much involved in the five-party talks and Certainly very much were. involved with <laughs> Sue's group as yeah. well. Okay. And yeah. indeed, sort of, and again, uh, for the sake of the record, my recollection of the discussions, uh, I can say categorically now I'm disappointed by the degree that, of which we are looking to hold account the special advisors when we were doing that. And that's one of the reasons why the looking down the legislative approach is probably gives us more scope to be able to deal with the problems of RHIs, RHI as they came. Okay. But, uh, but I just, wanted, I just yeah. wanted to make sure that was put on the record to do that. Can I just also just add, though, as well, I think another important change is the changes that we've made within the private office. So we have increased the grading of the private secretary uh, you know, to ministers. So it's a more senior person. Um, and, you know, we have, um, you know, I suppose, you know, also just, you know, put in some training and all of that as well. I just think there's a number of changes that have been made which are also, yeah, which are very, very important. Yeah. Sorry, just could you explain yeah. that? So I think before, and I don't know, because obviously, you know, uh, when I arrived, you know, we didn't have ministers. Um, I think it would have been, the private secretary would have been at staff officer. Um, it's now at grade seven. Um, Minister, will you agree with me that the conduct of many SPADs in the whole RHI era was disgraceful and single-handedly was responsible for the bringing down of the executive for three years? Do I believe that? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe there were a, a range of issues that brought down the executive. I think the RHI was a tipping point, but it wasn't on its own. Uh, so I think there were a range of issues. I mean, we've talked about previous uh, issues where special advisors were, were f found by a committee of the assembly to be uh, behaving in a manner which wasn't conducive to their appointment and that the minister responsible refused to take any action in relation to it. 
Uh, we had other issues uh, in relation to uh, other scandals attached to ministers and the executive. Uh, we had the general level of disrespect being shown for uh, identities within the executive. So uh, while undoubtedly the RHI issue, and, and, and bear in mind when, when uh, the full extent of each special advisor's role and all of the issues which emerged as the course inquiry wasn't known when the executive uh, collapsed. Uh, but certainly that was a factor in it, but it wasn't the only factor. Yeah. I was interested in your introduction. You mentioned various misdemeanours carried out by the uh, SPADs. You didn't mention that one particular party had a SPAD or two SPADs appointed outside the system whose job was to supervise those which were appointed within the system. Well, you're but making an assumption as to what their job was. And I say in relation to inquiry, and it, it, we're dealing here with a piece of legislation which is specifically about the role and function and conduct of special advisors and the inquiry's findings in relation to individuals in terms of their role and conduct uh, uh, and behaviour uh, was in relation to issues around uh, those which were mentioned. But you do accept that one party a de facto had appointed, well, let's call them super spads, whose job was to sit between this building and another building to supervise and control those spads that had been properly appointed. No, under that's the your system. interpretation of it. I, I'm not sure what interpretation the inquiry found of that. Well, the inquiry is very clear that there were spads who were answerable directly to spads who had been appointed by a political party rather than through the system, the normal vetting system, and who had ultimate control over the activities of the SPADs that were in this building. But the SPADs appointed by your party operated in exactly the same fashion. And two wrongs don't make a right. Do you accept that there was uh, two SPADs who were appointed outside the system who had total control over the SPADs within this building? No. You don't? So therefore the RHI report's got it wrong? No, the RHI report came to a view in relation to that. Uh, I mean, what, what, there was no findings, as far as I'm, I'm aware, in the RHA report in relation to the conduct of any of those people. The findings in relation to the conduct of people who were in office, who leaked emails, who had a fill your boots up approach, uh, who, uh, who, who, who as, as I say in my opening remarks, who were responsible for some of the behaviour uh, which was highly criticised by the uh, passing confidential information to family members, failing to declare conflicts of interest, and apparently acting without ministerial knowledge or oversight related to people who were in your former party. And of course there was misdemeanours on, on your side as well, the Sinn Féin side. What I'm saying is the criticism attached to individual spads and the behaviour related to people attached to your party. Yeah. I'm intrigued by what you said. Um, when this bill came to second reading, it was enthusiastically supported by all the parties apart from, from your own. Mr O'Dowd made it very clear he was opposed to the bill. And yet, from your introductory remarks, you'd seem to indicate that the executive have discussed this potential mm. private member's bill and have unanimously indicated they do not wish to go down this route, they want to go down the route of the uh, codes of conduct. Now, is that not at odds with the, with the vote of the Assembly? And, and all, I mean, Mr. Frew spoke enthusiastically on behalf of his party, we had the Alliance, we had the SDLP, etc., all saying that this, there's a lot of merit in this bill. How does that square with what you're telling us is that the executive have met, discussed this and have rejected it? Well, I think it, it squares in the fact that my party is consistent, at least in its approach, when yes. we do oppose the idea yes. of the bill, and we said that. Uh, this was discussed at the executive, and uh, without breaching confidentiality in terms of executive discussion, my clear take in relation to that was all of the parties of the executive did not agree uh, with legislation. That's why the chair's opening remarks have me somewhat bemused. Uh, the parties in the executive did not agree uh, that legislation was required. Uh, and you know yourself, you're about here long enough, uh, that the, uh, accepting that a bill should get a proper hearing and pass through second stage on to detailed scrutiny does not in any way indicate support for that bill uh, or any final intention in terms of voting uh, uh, arrangements for the bill, uh, that it's merely an attempt to allow a bill uh, to get sufficient hearing. But I took it from what you said and, and, and uh, Sue said that it was more than that, that the executive had discussed Mr Allister's bill yes. and had decided unanimously to oppose it. I said in my opening, all five parties to the executive are opposed to this bill. They're opposed to the bill. Yes. So the leadership, the, the ministers of the, the, the nine ministers, whatever, have unanimously said, we've got to kill the, kill the Allister bill. We have to, we You're have putting to your interpretation on, the, on the, what they've said. They say they're opposed to it. They're how, they, to it. how they choose to express that opposition right. in the floor of the Assembly is a matter for themselves. But the second reading wasn't simply a matter of saying this is a bill that should be considered. 
the tenor of the debate was enthusiastic support from all parties, <coughs> apart, your from your own, apart from your own, who were very consistent and very clear they do not want this bill. Mr O'Dowd couldn't have been clear. But everybody else who spoke from the other four parties enthusiastically supported the bill, and yet you're telling me at executive level they're saying it's dead in the water. Uh, and that's something that those party members need to square with their executive colleagues. Yeah. Okay. And finally, um, what I can understand from yourself and Mrs Gray is that uh, you're, you're, you have a beefed up code of conduct, you allege. But what is, there to be, what, what is there to be lost by having that uh, uh, embedded in legislation? Why? It's Mr Alistair who's going to do all the work of getting this bill through. So therefore, there's no cost implications as far as I can see to the Exchequer. So what, what's the problem with having it strengthened by having a legislative basis? Well, there are a number of issues that I have outlined, and I'm sure there are others, uh, but uh, I think two of the issues are the codes, as you will know, are fairly living documents. They're frequently amended and uh, added to, uh, and uh, depending on political circumstances that arise or issues that arise which were unforeseen uh, when a code was been drafted, uh, and that... that uh, that is much easier done when you have a code which can be taken through this process and approved by an executive uh, and an assembly. The other issue uh, I, I uh, think is that you, this code very firmly places the responsibility for those who are in special advisor posts to the person who appointed them into that post, that they are accountable and responsible and responsible for their discipline. This takes that, uh, the idea of legislation takes that away from them and takes it into a police and a judicial matter in terms of the responsibility and accountability. Yes, but of course, even if you had the legislation in place, and I see huge merit in this legislation, there's nothing to stop you amending the codes which are subservient to the legislation. So therefore, this idea you, that you could have a lack of flexibility, no, you haven't. You've got your overarching legislation and then you've got your code which can be amended. This isn't overarching legislation. This is legislation specific to special advisors, yes. which are one part of three sets of codes that the Assembly yes. operates under. Do you accept there's nothing in the legislation that would stop you amending the code on a daily basis if you wanted to? Well, there's something which would delay amending the code on the basis because it would have to be done through legislation, which would involve no. consultation no, 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 and codes, passage of legislation. No, the codes no. don't have to be amended by legislation. The codes can Well, if be you place the code in legislation, and it's not placing... Uh, this is placed in one code out of uh, uh, a group of three sets of codes which apply to ministers, the civil service, and bear in mind special advisors are uh, uh, then become, on a temporary basis, temporary civil servants as well, so they're part of the civil service code. Uh, so there's a read across into that as well. Uh, so it's not an overarching piece of legislation under which other things can be framed. This is a specific piece of legislation for one part of the codes which apply to people who work throughout the system, be they ministers, advisors, or civil servants. So let's, for, this, for the sake of argument, find that a, a SPAD in the Department of Finance has behaved, and behaved very badly. Perhaps he's been leaking information to someone else in a party political headquarters, just as a purely fictional suggestion. And action's taken against him. What's to stop our her? What's to stop the minister stepping in and preventing any disciplinary action being taken against him? Because that would probably put them in breach of code, uh, the code of ministerial conduct. And who's the ultimate decision as to whether action is taken against him or her or not? Who, who, who makes that decision under what you're suggesting? The minister makes the decision. Makes, the minister makes the decision. And have yeah, we not if had the minister refuses, as in the case of a former colleague of yours, who I think you supported at the time, if the minister refuses to take action against the special adviser when it's clear that there's a, a breach of the code on which they were appointed, then the minister themselves can be held accountable for that refusal to act. And, and, and how, what action can be taken against the minister in those circumstances? Sorry? What action can be taken against the minister in those circumstances? The minister can be then uh, investigated under the ministerial code of conduct and... Uh, and? And what? And the, 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 the code, the very code that you operated under as a minister, yeah. gladly, I'm sure, uh, that you operated under, that the party responsible for the appointment of that minister then is uh, obliged to take action in relation to that. Or if they don't, then they, they face the, 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 the choice of the electorate at the next election. Yeah. That's the code that you operated under mm -hmm. as a minister. So uh, I, I you didn't object to it at the time. I know you have a different position now that you're no longer within the fold of the party, but that's the code you operated under. That's entirely the behaviour of a minister that you supported at the time took where he refused to act on the basis of a committee finding in relation to a special adviser. This would make that situation not 
uh, acceptable in that the Minister themselves would be held accountable for their lack of action in that regard. Well, I certainly would have had no problem with a legislative underpinning of the Code at the time. But what I'm saying to you is you, you, you've had a Code. But you, you're, you're saying that a Code is deficient in that had you been found as a Minister to be yes. uh, responsible for behaviour that was unacceptable, then the, the consequence of that was your party would be obliged to take action against you. Yeah. What I'm saying to you and that's still the consequence. I'm saying, saying it you, wasn't an issue for you at that time, but it is an issue for you now. It is because obviously subsequently I've heard of the appalling behaviour of SPADs and all parties in this chamber, which is about all parties. Yes, particularly Sinn Féin and, and, and the DUP. Well, yes. it did, there's no record of, of a criticism of the behaviour of any SPAD in Sinn Féin. There's a criticism of how people were appointed and how people were acting, but there's no record of criticism of their behaviour. There is record of criticism no. of the UP SPADs. Your SPADs were carrying information out of this building to those who are their superiors in a party political office who were not appointed under the system of the code that you've outlined. That's what's happened. And that is documented in the RHI report. It's factual. Now, that's a major breach of the code of conduct and there was nothing under that system could stop it, and I don't think there's anything under your code of conduct would stop it either. Well, that's, that's your view, uh, but I, I would remind you that you were part of a party that was responsible for major breaches of the code of conduct. It didn't cause you so much problem then. You didn't leave the party over it. You left the party over other matters, uh, and subsequent to all this being revealed uh, was the time when you parted company. You were a minister serving under that party, under those arrangements, when I suggest that you were answerable to other people within the party uh, rather than yourself. Okay. Thanks very much, Cindy. Jim. Yeah. Uh, first of all, could I thank the department for a meeting that was facilitated last week between the permanent secretary, Bill Pauley, and myself about the, some of the presentational terminology issues in the draft bill, and um, that was useful to me. And I'm taking some of those matters forward. Uh, so today, I want to focus, if I can, Minister, on what really is the fundamental divide here. It's not so much that there's a disagreement about the need to cover certain issues. The disagreement is whether that is adequately done by code or whether it needs legislation. legislation. I think you'd agree that's probably yep. the essence of the point. And would you also agree there's nothing mutually exclusive between legislation and a code? Let me illustrate it with one of the clauses in this bill. One of the clauses says no special advisor shall be paid more than a grade five civil servant. So it sets a ceiling. But that allows the codes, as you have done, to set the bandings. It doesn't say this shall be the salary. It says here's the ceiling of the salary. So codes and legislation live very comfortably together. Uh, and you accept the principle of that. Well, I mean, your legislation goes much further than the salary issue. Oh, yes, so yes, I'm just using that whether, by way of illustration. Whether individual clauses within your legislation are more compatible than other individual clauses, and whether the sum total of that means that your legislation yes. is but necessary the, the or principle, The principle is that legislation and codes can live one with the other. I well, I, I, I would argue in this, in this case that the, this, this legislation applies to one code, which is in a suite of three sets of codes, and particularly in, in the relation to this one, is overlapping, probably is overlapping between all three, but certainly overlapping no, between sorry, this and the, this the civil applies. service code, because the persons you're legislating for here are temporary civil servants. No, no, uh, this bill applies to ministers, to special advisors, to civil servants. It's not only a special advisors bill. It's, it's called the function of government. It's about all those. But the principle is, like, take, take the codes that you've been able to bring about. They are only possible because of the 2013 Act, which says there shall be codes. But that didn't inhibit you in the content of those codes outside the parameters set by that legislation. Likewise here, the codes that you change from time to time can be changed subject to them being compatible with what the governing legislation says. That's the essence of how codes and legislation work, is it not? Uh, and, you know, Mr. Sterling was here last week, and he agreed that legislation gives stronger protection than codes. Do you disagree with him? 
Well, I didn't hear his view being expressed. If that was his view, do you disagree well, with that? Then it would leave me wonder why that he has accepted as the head of the civil service that these codes are the way to go forward. No. And, I mean, they were brought through the executive process, yes, uh, or no. agreed. No, so I don't want to mislead you. He no, but I mean, if you're, generic... if you're saying, if, you, if, if the inference of what you're saying that the head of the civil service is expected is this is a kind of lesser uh, approach to dealing with this, then that leaves me again a little bit like the five parties on the executive in a bit of a quandary of how no, people no. say he one was thing accepting, in one forum and one I don't want to be unfair to him at all. I think he was accepting the generic principle that legislation will always give more certainty than a code, which is a lesser thing. I think that's the principle he was accepting. And of course, it's in line with what I quoted in the second stage debate of what Lord Bingham said about codes, when he said, it is my view plain that the codes do not have the binding effect which a statutory <clears throat> provision or statutory instrument would have. Like that's, it's, a, it's a truism, but it's undeniably so that a code cannot have the binding effect of legislation, which leads me to wonder what is the fear of legislation? See, what you said in your letter to us on the 27th of April was interesting. You said, it's also important that those rules, which are to codes, are amenable to interpretation and the application of judgment. That sounds a little bit like we want to be able to do what we like. Well, therefore, not, therefore so. we want codes that we can are amenable to interpretation and they're amenable to the application of judgment. Which is are, that the truth? Is the law not amenable to interpretation and the application of judgment? No, but there's, there's a supreme authority when it comes to the law. Um, you see... Uh, but can I say, can I say, I mean, this process, which I have ended up having responsibility for and produced these codes under, was the product of five parties to the executive agreement before the executive was reinstated. It was d undertaken and developed over the course of many, many meetings in light of the evidence that was emerging from the RHI inquiry. The RHI inquiry confirmed, uh, as the five parties had agreed, Improved codes were needed, not legislation. Improved codes were needed. RHI inquiry confirmed that they didn't believe legislation was needed. They needed improved codes, and uh, we had already taken some steps towards that. Well, it didn't that. say it didn't need legislation. Sorry? It didn't say it didn't need legislation. It said the codes that you have need to be strengthened, and they need to be implemented. Well, it didn't recommend legislation. Yeah. Uh, neither did the five parties who drafted... But just for a sake of clarity, and again, taking the fact that I was involved in those conversations... We did not say we wouldn't have legislation. The principle was we wanted to get codes or we wanted to get proposals that would have reformed government so we wouldn't get back to the RHI situation, which we were. There was no discussion about whether it was going to go to legislation or not. That's not to say that legislation wasn't part of the consideration, which it was. So just for the record, let's make sure that's part and parcel of the process. But I presume if you recommended then that the codes were strengthened, then you didn't consider that legislation, that strengthening the codes would not achieve the outcome that you desired, which is to ensure we had a system which wouldn't allow the institutions that the RHI inquiry threw up. So I presume there was a satisfaction that strengthening the codes would achieve that outcome. And that's my point to Mr yeah. Alistair, that the inquiry obviously had the same view as, as the five-party working group, which produced the bulk of what is in this, uh, this code, saying that uh, strengthened codes uh, would be sufficient to achieve the outcome of ensuring that we hadn't got the type of behaviour that the RHI inquiry threw up. Yes, but Minister, no matter how strong you make the code, it's still just a code. Uh, and but the judgment of five parties plus the RHI yes, inquiry the was five, that you know, it was possible to improve the, the situation. Not the judgment of Solomon, it might at the time be the judgment of five parties. But you're, but but you're, yeah, but you're, you're <laughs> pitting your own judgment and your own opinion against that, and that's your you know, prerogative to do I'm that. I'm putting my opinion to the House, that's and the House has agreed the principles of the Bill that's, at the second stage. And that's, your, and that's the House's prerogative. What Absolutely. I'm saying to you is, the, I'm being asked here as question as the Minister for Finance responsible yeah. for the code which has been produced yes. as to why this standard of approach 
was considered yes. acceptable. Yes. And I'm asking and I'm, I'm, why you're scared of legislation. And I'm rooting it back in the agreement that was made by the five parties in terms of production of the material for this, confirmed by the, the inquiry itself, saying that uh, the, the, I, the way to deal with this was to strengthen the codes, well, that, and that's what we have can, done. Can I, can I put this point to you? The old codes also said things like, you must preserve confidentiality. Mm -hmm. You must act with integrity and honesty. The codes said that as strongly as they liked, but it didn't prevent the situation evolving where that was breached. Your code can put as boldly as it likes all these things, and they can have the same fate as the old codes. You know, agricultural expert distributing documents to his family. Breach of confidentiality, yeah. breach of the code. A minister, no less, in the economy, Minister Hamilton, colluding with his own special advisor and a special advisor in the first minister's office to leak back to his own permanent secretary as a false trail internal documents to try and take the heat off his own party. That was in patent breach of codes and of ministerial code. Uh, Yet it all happened. Civil servants giving documents to my park. Shouldn't have happened. Happened long before RHI, Mr. Brimstone, hmm. uh, over Red Sky, uh, doing what he shouldn't have been doing, in essence, bullying Jenny Palmer. Your department steps in, recommends that he should be disciplined, hmm. and the minister of the time, Mr. McCausman, quashes it. Mm. Now, at that time, the Social Development Committee reduced a report, and the Social Development Report recommended that there should be a change to stop a minister intervening and aborting investigative processes. Exactly one of the clauses that's in my bill. And one of the issues that's addressed by this improved code for ministers, whereby they are responsible and accountable. And if they don't take action, such as, and this is exactly the discussion I had with Mr. Wells, who would have been supportive of Mr. McCausland at the time, yeah. uh, that if they don't take action, then they themselves can be reported and investigated for a breach of their own. Do you code. know that's a phantom thing? Because, uh, well, the, I mean, because the minister in the that case. inquiry also had the, the ability to recommend no, no. for people for prosecution in relation to those matters. Yeah, you know that's a phantom thing because at the end of the day, whether that minister is disciplined or not is down to his party. So it, it's, it's, a fix, it's a fixed, it's a fictional thing. The, par the party of which you were a member when it held ministers in this institution. No, I wasn't. You were a member when, in, in, when no, no, I wasn't. people were in the first executive. No, I wasn't. You were a member right up to the St Andrews Agreement. Oh, yes. It was there yes, with yes, you at it. Yes. Uh, when, when DUP ministers sat in the executive yes, under yes. these but, but, but weakened, this, this as you see it, weakened codes that apply to that stage. A bit like Mr. Wales. No, fr the frankly, Minister, Minister I have to correct you. You're wrong. There were no codes under law until my special advisor's bill of 2013, which your party voted against. You weren't here. You were furloughed to the House of Commons at the time. But uh, until that moment... I wasn't on 80%, I can assure you. <laughs> no, until, <laughs> until that... Just full expenses. Uh, but until that time, Minister, there were no statutory codes. It was my first bill that your party opposed that brought in statutory codes. And now you are opposing the bringing in of legislation to supplement and uh, make sure that codes don't fail again. Why are you scared of legislation? Um, Is it because you want that flexibility to be um, things to be amenable to interpretation and the application of judgment so as you can do what you like? No, not at all. And I, I, well, then I, there's nothing to fear in legislation. But I'm following through on the proposition that was developed by five parties. And that, in, five accordance, parties. in accordance, it will, you know, you either believe in democracy or you don't. I know you have issues with how this uh, this particular institution well, is framed. I believe, I but believe in five the parties in this up, house. The five parties who make up, and if the, five, if the parties change their view and support your bill, that's a matter of democratic choice. Well, no one called a vote to oppose the principles of this bill in second stage. 
That's correct. And right. that's, a, that's the democratic and many prerogative spoke, of this and House. Many no, spoken words. But, may, but may, it's no answer, Minister Shirley, with respect to say, oh, back six months ago, nine months ago, whatever, the five parties took a view. Therefore, that's like the laws of the Medes and Persians. It can't be changed. It doesn't matter if you come up with something better. That's it. We're sticking with that. That's the most churlish attitude I can imagine. Well, can I say, what I'm here representing is the code I produced. Yes. And I'm giving you the basis for which the code I produced. Yes. So and I'm saying your code yeah, can yeah, live with arguing, this legislation. You're arguing to do something different in terms of legislation. That's your prerogative. And if the Assembly and the institution here supports that legislation, then it will be passed and it will be law. Yeah. But, I, I'm but what saying, I, I'm saying to you is that I, I'm operating on the basis of, of the, the remit I was given. I don't believe legislation is necessary, yeah. so I'm clear, stating that view to you clearly. I have uh, supporting guidance from my own department, which doesn't believe the legislation is necessary. I had discussions at the executive table where executive colleagues didn't believe legislation was necessary. If the Assembly changes its mind and votes to support your bill, sure. then it is passed. Yes, but the, point, the fundamental point I'm making to you is there's a compatibility between having codes and having legislation. The two dovetail. They're not mutually exclusive. Your mindset seems to be it's one or the other. It's not. You can have legislation that sets certain parameters, and then you have codes that amplify. That's how codes work. Well, that's, that's, as I say, that's your prerogative. The Assembly uh, can decide uh, whether finally, it, I just want Assembly to make, can decide whether it agrees yeah, with you yeah. or not. I, I wanted to uh, take issue with you when you said that by creating criminal offences, we would be transferring responsibility from ministers to police and courts. That's just not correct. If a civil servant or a special advisor today commits an act of theft in their office... That's crime. Any that's sense. crime. It's not part of a code. Yes, but that's crime. Yeah, but these codes apply to behaviour. And I'm create, I want to create the crime. If, I, if, if, if a civil servant assaults somebody in their office, yes. they're guilty of a crime. It, does, which it is doesn't dealt undermine with, the ministers. No, but it is, that, is dealt, that is dealt with under criminal legislation. Yes, and likewise, if a civil servant leaks so should we for put confidential in the, advantage to someone else material, that should be a crime. That's what Clause 11 that's says. That's yep. the, yep. the, the two points you're making don't conflate. You're saying, should we put into a code civil service should not steal from the office, the civil service should yeah. not assault another person in the office? Uh, those are crimes under their own right. Yes. What we're doing is creating a code in terms of behaviour in office. Yes. And these are the types of codes that but apply Minister, in, in, in public sector and private sector employment. We've, we've had examples of SPADs for the advantage of others leaking documents. Yes. We've had an example of a minister for the advantage of others leaking documents. And the inquiry could I'm saying, the I'm saying that is such a gross thing to do that it should be an offence. If a House agrees with me, well and good. Yeah. But to simply say in a code, you shouldn't do that, and we'll slap your wrists if you don't. If you do, already haven't got away with it before, under codes that said the same things, then it's not a sufficiency of response to the situation. Well, I believe it is. These are issues which uh, I think should, I agree with you, that they were reprehensible and should not have happened. And I think that what we were obliged to do was to strengthen the codes to make sure they can't happen again. Are those who are responsible themselves are held accountable, or if not, those who are responsible for putting them in the position that they're in are held accountable for their actions? But it can all happen again under your codes. For, thank you, Jim. Thank just, you. For a, just for a moment of clarity, Sue, in your experience and previous experience working in the Cabinet Office, if a special adviser to a minister had leaked a document that was classified in any form to a, another company or a business, and that was used for particularly for business advantage or economic advantage by that company, would that have been investigated by the Metropolitan Police and would that have been taken as a criminal offence? Um, I think that the threshold for referring something to the police would be very, very high. Um, and I think you'd have to look at the individual circumstances, but I think that it, would, it is a very high threshold to refer something to the police. Okay. Okay. Uh, Paul. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your attendance here. I want to talk 
uh, Minister, about your letter you sent us, as Jim has alluded to, on the 27th of April. But before that, there's something that has troubled me since the second reading. And whilst you're the Minister, you happen to be in a party, but your party colleague stated that his party, your party, wouldn't support this bill, wouldn't vote for it favourably in the second reading because it came from a private member. Is that your understanding as to why Sinn Féin doesn't support this bill? Because if it is, that's a grievance to every single private member in this place and a, a complete disrespect to their ability to bring forward private members' legislation at any given time on any given subject. Well, I, I don't know who made the remark, and it's not a principle. We have supported private members' bills before, and I'm sure we'll support them again. So the issues are the content of the bill and the yeah. purpose and the intent of the bill. Uh, that's what has caused us to express opposition, as is your party, as has the Chairman's party, as have the Alliance party, uh, as have the SDLP uh, uh, expressed opposition to it. That's what causes us to oppose it. Yeah. Yet, yet my party uh, gave me authority to support it at second stage. So, so you, 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 re you realise that there's different layers of legislation here and stages to go through, um, and that this bill could look completely different by the time we go to voting on it. Well, that may be your intention. I'm sure Mr Alistair would be interested to see what you and how you intend to neuter his bill in some stage in the future. But, uh, strengthen it. No, strengthen it. 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 Strengthen that any individual MLA or indeed party supports the final outcome of that bill. That's the, the passage of legislation. It may well mean that people want to expose what they consider to be the inadequacies of it in a committee stage or a further amending stage, or it may be that they wish to add to it and change it in some other fashion. That's the passage of legislation. Or there could be just a genuine will to make sure that the errors of the past do not happen again, and that there is a whiff, a strong whiff, of reform required in this place. And it is the duty of all of us, MLAs, backbenchers and ministers and an executive, which is different, to actually try and reform this place that it performs better. Yeah, but I have to say, if people had to behave according to the codes, uh, then you know perhaps we wouldn't be in the situation we're discussing strengthening codes. So for me, the principle uh, issue in terms of how special advisors behave and how their ministers respond to that behaviour is something that you know. I don't think it's a, a, a very strong argument. To say make codes, make codes stronger, so we'll behave better. You know that should be a, a facet of public life anyway. It should be, yeah. but it, and so, it certainly hasn't been. Well, uh, and, and that's why we're then exploring the possibility of needing and requiring legislation, because if the if the codes of conduct are complete, continuously being misinterpreted. Or not used, and there's misconduct continuously. It's not good enough just to keep strengthening a code of conduct that's going to be ignored anyway. Would you agree with that? Well, I mean, I can only speak for myself. I have no intention of ignoring a code of conduct. If a party intends to continue to ignore it, or to try and exploit it, or to try and find loopholes in it, or to disregard it, then that speaks to that party and their behaviour. Uh, it doesn't speak to the code. Would we all all of these institutional arrangements? as in all democratic institutions, have a set of rules and regulations. Uh, and if somebody wants to come in and try and thwart them and, and behave how they, uh, then you, you look to codes to protect the institution, to protect democracy in that regard. Uh, but you can't stop the behaviour of individuals. What you can do is hold them to account for that behaviour. OK, so in your letter then, 27th of April, you state, having rules on the standards of behaviour for ministers and civil servants, including special advisors, is critical. And it is very important that those rules are observed and enforced. I agree. But it is also important that those rules are amenable to interpretation and the application of judgment, and that the rules can be developed and enhanced as circumstances require. So you've got a code of conduct, which is the standard bearer. In, in what circumstances should they then be developed? Surely that rule is the rule that's good, efficient, standard of behaviour and work, what circumstances would change those code of conduct? <coughs> and and where, where would you see fit that another minister in your executive and another SPAD could interpret the codes of conduct in whatever way they seem fit? 
No, it, it's not a question of them interpreting the code of conduct way. See, but uh, circumstances change. I mean, I was long enough here uh, with Mr. Wells to remember when we set in place the first set of Stanton orders for this institution. They have changed multiple, multiple times over the years. Uh, they're very regular. That's why we have a committee for procedures to continuously look at the Stanton orders of this institution, to add to them, to remove ones which become outdated or don't address current. Take, for instance, technology. I mean, this refers to emails. We've, we've all had a massive technological advance over the last six or seven weeks in terms of how we communicate. So perhaps the codes will need to be refreshed to take in WebEx or Zoom or, or certain things like that. So, I mean, codes in relation to an institution, and that's why you have books that size in, in Westminster that have developed uh, over the years, uh, are constantly changing because society is constantly changing. Uh, the systems we use for government uh, are constantly changing, and codes need to be able to uh, move to reflect that and to be amended quickly if it's needed uh, and, and to be a constantly, if you like, living document. That's what codes yeah, are. Yeah, but you addressed that in your last sentence in that paragraph by saying putting these standards of behaviour into primary legislation would rule out the kind of responsiveness and judgment that is required to make rules efficient and fast-moving and complex environments. Now, I don't agree because primary legislation is different from codes <coughs> of conduct, but you still haven't addressed but it is also important that those rules are amenable to interpretation and to the application of judgment. What does that actually mean? Because I don't want to misquote you or put a slant on your own terminology, but what do you mean by that? I mean, if a minister has to make a judgment, if somebody's alleged to have been a breach of code, and they're responsible for their behaviour, they're going to have to make a judgment. If they refuse to make a judgment or they refuse, then uh, the commissioners are going to have to make a judgment. The commissioners have to be able to take into account all of the circumstances, uh, which would be complex or changing, or the circumstances within. For instance, one, as I say, one aspect, how communications are conducted uh, have changed rapidly in the last six weeks. Uh, so commissioners have to be able to interpret uh, understand the circumstances in which a particular set of behaviours were undertaken and make a judgment as to whether that was a very deliberate breach in, along the lines, Mr. Strauss, from a deliberate leaking of confidential information for material gain or inadvertently breaching a communication rule. That's just an example. Uh, so, of course, there has to be an ability for somebody to make a judgment. We, we put commissioners in place to make that judgment uh, and people can make complaints to them in that regard. On the actual, oh, sorry, my screens went uh, boogaloo here. So on the actual clauses, what, uh, and again, I'll not take up the meeting too long, but it's very important that we get in the nitty of some of your responses to it, because you were kind enough to put them in as clause by clause, and, and I appreciate that. But clause one six uh, of of the the bill, uh, uh, the response, your response states that the code of conduct and contract of employment already includes provision for only a properly constituted SPAD being able to fulfil the functions of a SPAD and that everything else would be unlawful. Uh, how, how would it be unlawful? It would be unlawful because if you were trying to purport to fill the function of a, uh, an appointment that you weren't appointed to. So you would have, you would have a scenario whereby a collective of spads, I don't know what the, 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 that is, but... A <laughs> rubber of spads, <laughs> maybe? A, what, sir? a rubber of a spads? Rub collective of spads. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have all some sort, sort, sorts of fun with terminology here. A collection of spads would maybe report to a higher source or a higher body or a higher collective or a higher person. How, how would those codes of conduct prevent that spad going to and being accountable to a line manager that is not the minister well in the only situation where that would pertain would be in teo where there are a number of special advisors so i presume that they are line managed no well, someone sorry. someone even outside of the the executive room someone outside maybe maybe a party official or officer and i can, I can talk about i could talk about any party in that regard because we're trying to we're trying to safeguard the accountability and the confidence of this assembly well, and executive. In terms of line management, the only people, the SPADs, who would be line managed in a collective way would be the SPADs and TEO on either side of the FM or the FM side. Other SPADs are individually appointed by a minister, so they're answerable to that minister. That's their line management. So the SPAD in finance is answerable to me. 
Spadden, Deira is an answerable dead when puts. Uh, the only place where line management might occur uh, is with when you have a collective group of, of spas within TEO. What, what, if, what, if, what if the line manager for the minister is actually the SPAD? This, this isn't Tim Johnson we're talking about. This is normal parties. So, so, so if it could happen in any party, it could happen in yours. And it could happen, even if it does happen in any party, well then, surely you need to safeguard that because you're a member of the executive. Well, the person who's answerable for, firstly, the behaviour of the special advisor is me. And the person who's answerable for decisions and actions I take is me. And I'm, I'm subject to complaints being made and a commissioner making a judgment in terms of my actions. That's, that's, the buck stops with me in terms of my behaviour in the Department of Finance. The buck stops with me in terms of the behaviour of my special advisor in the Department of Finance. But, but yet we've had concerns shown by civil, senior civil servants in the past with your predecessor not being able to have the ability to make decisions on his own and being under instruction. You take your instructions from Tim Johnson? No. You must be the only person in the DUP that doesn't. Well, uh, I'm sure that, Mr. Wells would concur that's, with me. Well, that's, that's maybe. You see, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a member of the Legislative Assembly. Ah, well, do, do so you, did your ministers take their. Uh, I pose the question so, back to Mr. Wells. Did so he could, take his instruction so, while, as a minister from Tim so, Johnson? So, so if I was Lily Leverton and On the, on the, on the grounds for, that I'm probably enjoying this conversation too much, <laughs> I shall sort of ask you just to keep to the comp. Uh, the, so the, the, the so, so, on, so, so if, if there was MLAs that would be prone to being victims of bullying, and ministers in the same guise. Surely those people need protected by legislation that ensures... Can you, can you tell me, because I've been looking at Mr Alder's legislation, and I don't see in that protection of ministers from bullying uh, an aspect of it. So, I mean, you're maybe describing a situation that you're more familiar with in your own party terms than I am. <laughs> uh, but I'm telling you now, under these codes, that are, as they are written, as they are agreed by the five parties that, that, that were responsible for drafting them, that a minister is responsible for his, his or her own decision making, and that they are also responsible for the behaviour and the conduct of their special adviser. And they are answerable to a complaints commissioner if they're found to be in breach of that. So to go into a commissioner, I would, I would suggest and say, I'm sorry, I was bullied into doing that, is hardly a reasonable defence. Uh, and I, I don't recognise that situation happening, uh, certainly in any experience I've ever had, of being bullied into decisions that I otherwise would have ta wouldn't have taken. So the, the issue around and the concern shown by the civil service with regards to ministers being under instruction from people outside of the executive room, uh, that's, you don't recognise that or you don't fear that could happen? I don't recognise it, certainly in relation to my own party, and I can only speak to my own party experience. But surely, surely you should be guarding against other parties being involved in practices like that when you're a part of the collective executive, and, and confidence is key nowadays. Sure, surely you want to progress that and make it better and make it more resilient. So uh, why would we bring a rule in to say Tim Johnson can't instruct your ministers? Is that, uh, I mean, you have to, if you're going to make these suggestions, then you're going to have to bring forward some solution for it. Uh, your, the premise of your discussion here, can I say, is that all of the ministers are controlled by somebody outside oh, of no, the executive. No, no. But I'm saying it only takes one occasion where that could happen, and that the confidence of the executive falls. So, uh, so that we so need to then we go back to the original thing about make rules so I won't misbehave. If a party comes into the executive intent on misbehaving, then it's very hard to draft a set of rules for every one of those circumstances. So. What you have to do, as all responsible parties should be doing, is going into an executive to behave properly within the defined rules of that institution and doing the best job you can in terms of the people that represent you. And yet here we are, with an RHI inquiry, with a whole lot of issues and circumstances and question marks around the conduct of a lot of the SPADs. Not all, but a lot of the SPADs. Hmm. So we need to try and resolve that for the yeah. confidence of our people. Uh, but the, what you're suggesting to me then is much beyond that. You're suggesting an authority over ministers and uh, 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 some kind of regulation to stop ministers being bullied into taking decisions that they wouldn't otherwise have taken. What, what, I, what I am most definitely suggesting is a reform bill from the executive. Is there any sign of a reform bill from the executive? Any sign of a, a reform bill in light of the RHI inquiry? Because you, you, the executive should not leave it to private members to 
to put through legislation. No, but what the executive agreed and what your party agreed, along with other parties, was that we would strengthen the codes. That's what we have done. The executive also agreed that we would form, and that was part of the NDNA, <coughs> The commitments that got the institution back up and working again, that on the, in light of the findings of the inquiry, we would form an executive subcommittee to analyse those findings and strengthen where is required. Had the RHI inquiry suggested that we needed legislation, then I'm sure we would have looked at the idea of legislation. Okay, and final question, so is, is there a time scale on the work of that committee? There was a time scale, as you will understand, it's been under, interrupted by COVID and the executive hasn't been able to function in the way it would normally have functioned, but there was a, a time scale, I, I, I think within it was three, well, I think to, number of months. Within three months. Three months, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, we, been, and, and I we, presume will get, we will get back to that. When we pick up that work again, we will, we will yeah. go back to the same time scale. Okay. And, and just you. a couple of points, sorry, just on some of the, I think, issues about civil servants raising concerns or other people raising concerns. We've strengthened both the civil service code Unlike anywhere else, we're actually very specific that if a civil servant has got a concern about the behaviour of a minister or a special advisor, they can raise that concern with, their, you know, with anybody in the civil service, their line manager, their permanent secretary, or with the civil service commissioner. We've also got the um, enforcement panel of uh, external commissioners, and as a civil servant, you can go there as well. Anybody can make a complaint to them. So I think just you know, there are complaints processes that actually are being introduced here that are no. Then, then in you know in in cabinet office where I've come from, only the prime minister can decide if there is something to be investigated, um, and then refer then can refer it to an advisor. Um, but that is all done very internally. This is a very external complaints process that we have put in place. Just for sake of clarity, uh, yeah. what is a speak up champion? It's a whistle. Yeah, so if you want is it, to, is it the same as a, is it same as same a whistle? As a whistle I think whistleblowing can sometimes have connotations, and people can sometimes think that if they've got a concern, um, it's not really whistleblowing. They see whistleblowing in a particular way. So it's just about speaking up. You know, giving people but will the, confidence. A, the speak up champion and the role of the speak up champion have the same sort of uh, force as with the whistleblowers legislation and the rest of it? Yeah, and they would be, they're there really to act as a champion for somebody who may not feel they've got the confidence to perhaps, you know, raise the concern themselves. They can go and talk to them. Um, they're, you know, a bit like, a, I suppose, somebody in the department who will support them through a process, give them advice on what to do, what the legislation says. It's meant to be a, it's a supporting role. And the role for this is if somebody feels as if a special advisor or a minister is acting out with the yeah. rules. Now, you know, well, as a civil servant, you may feel that actually you don't need to get any advice on that. You'll just go straight to the Civil Service Commission or you'll go to your permanent secretary. But if you're a bit unsure, you might want to talk to somebody about what you might do. That would be what the role, you know, the role of the Speak Up champion is there as a supportive role to give advice, but to also perhaps sometimes even take the complaint forward themselves if an individual feels they can't do it. And there was also a discussion within the sort of, I'm just sort of looking at the sort of the, the code of, uh, new code of ethics, yeah. the idea of a time limit. So what, uh, but it doesn't specify the time limit about bringing forward a complaint. There isn't a time, I'm not sure there's a time limit. No, it just, it just mentions within a time limit taken with the commissioners within a specified time limit. Oh, that would be for the, 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 so that's for the Civil Service Commission. I, I don't know what their time limit is, but I suppose what they're trying to avoid is getting involved in cases that are many, many years old and perhaps the records wouldn't be around or something. I don't know. Okay. If you could find out what the yeah. time limit is and yeah. just let, us, we'll let, let the committee know, because that yeah. might be of use. Uh, okay. Matthew? Thank, thank you, Chair. Thanks both for coming in. Um, um, Minister, um, since the change code came into, and thanks for, in advance for craning your necks, um, or not, if you don't feel you have to turn, you can, I won't be offended if you, do, you don't make eye contact as you're answering me. Um, <laughs> since, you were, uh, since, you were, since you've taken office in January with the new code put in place, how has that changed the, uh, your approach to government? And that actually applies to both of you, both the Minister and the Permanent Secretary. My own approach? Or yeah. Uh, well, I think you're, you're clearly, because we've all been through the experience uh, of watching the outcome of the inquiry, we all have a recognition, uh, as I think, uh, whether parties felt more culpable in terms of, of what went down in RHI and, and previous issues or not. We all, uh, there was a strong sense, and that I think that probably underpinned the work of that five-party group. I wasn't on it, but I would have got various reports from it. Uh, 
that underpinned that work to recognise that there was a, a real need uh, for a demonstration, not just in terms of satisfying uh, the ability of people to be held to account, but in general terms for the public, that there was a, a real need uh, to demonstrate a, a much more robust approach to ensuring that the type of behaviour which was evident during the origin inquiry, which arg arguably manifested itself before that in various other instances, uh, was going to be uh, was not going to be permissible and 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 would be dealt with in a much more robust fashion. So, uh, I, I think, I mean, I can't I can't sit here to tell you today what's going on in every single department at the moment. What I can say is that, in my view, the arrangements that are in place, uh, as Sue has alluded to, whereby civil servants can speak out, whereby special advisers are now clearly accountable to the ministers who appointed them, whereby if ministers uh, uh, some matters brought to attention and they refuse to act on that. In themselves, they are accountable to a commission should a, a complaint be made where the complaints process is much more accessible than you will find in any other institution in, in these islands in terms of uh, individual members, uh, that that all leads to a, a stronger uh, position. Obviously, the experience of that will be in how people demonstrate how they do their business over the, the coming period. And I hope, uh, as, as I answered to Mr. Frew, the, the strongest a uh, guarantee of all of this work and is actually how parties themselves behave in relation to when they're in an office. Relative to your previous stint as a minister, which I think was 2007, 2011, that's right, are you on a day-to-day -day basis doing anything differently in terms of how you approach either the job or your management of a special advisor? Uh, well, clearly, uh, we, I had no issues between 2007 and 2011 with the special advisor that I had, or any. There was never any uh, questions raised in relation to him. Uh, I, I would say, if you were asked in, uh, in terms of notice, I do uh, notice the difference in terms of the private secretary being much more uh, a much more senior figure uh, rather than just an administrative assistant, as somebody who actually gives advice at meetings rather than, than simply records. Uh, somebody who makes a contribution, uh, and I think in that terms, uh, the private office, to me, well, it's no reflection on the previous private office that I worked with, who are all uh, very wonderful people and very professional in what they did. The private office, to me, seems to be much more empowered in terms of its advice and, and, uh, and, and ensuring that the correct uh, advice has been given to you and ensuring that there's proper checks and balances to make sure that communications are correct uh, and done in correct order. Uh, so I, I would see an increased adherence. I had a gap of a number of years in not serving as a minister, so whether that has only occurred now or had begun to occur over that period, I, I couldn't uh, attest to, but uh, I, I have to say I do see a much more, uh, uh, a stronger approach in terms of private office, and I'm fortunate that I have a, a good working relationship with the Permanent Secretary, uh, so uh, I, I, I have no doubt that should I have any disregard for the rules, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be long being uh, advised of them. Do you think, so that, I, I want to come on in a second, if I may, Chair, to the uniqueness of the institutions here, but does that mean, having a more senior private secretary, does that mean they do more of the, um, when I say bartering, I don't mean that in a, a pejorative sense, but the necessary negotiation and arbitrage that goes on between a multi-party executive? Are the, it, some, some of the concern in the past had been that SPADs were doing a lot of that. Is your private secretary and our private secretaries in general doing more of that than mm. they were in the past? No, I mean, bear in mind, it's, it's been a very limited experience, this, this particular mandate, and a lot of it has been taken up by, if you like, kind of a, a very unusual uh, approach to the COVID response in mm. terms of people have been operating uh, in a very different manner from what should be expected when we went in. I don't mean that I mean people have been disregarding rules or regulations, but it's not a normal set of circumstances. I, I don't know. I don't see the role of private secretary in terms of that bartering role. Uh, I know that the SPADs would still, uh, if there were issues between uh, disagreement or, uh, you know, if, it's quite often the case if you go to submit a proposition to the executive, you circulate it among ministers. If some ministers have particular issues and they're communicated back to you, you try and and see who can match that. There would be a role for the permanent secretary to permanent secretary in that regard, and whatever other senior officials in the department were talking to their counterparts on the other side. It's a very, as I say, formal role between the, the different levels of civil servants to make sure that those things are teased out to the satisfaction so that uh, of both ministers, so when, when a proposition goes to the executive, then it is a reasonable prospect of being supported and, and moving through. That's 
the reason we do bring propositions to the executive. So I, I don't necessarily see, and Sue may have more understanding of that than I, but I don't see the role of the private secretary being in that there. No. They're responsible for assisting in the communication yeah. of all of that and have an understanding of where things are at, but not necessarily in terms of engaging in some kind of negotiation on your behalf. I, mean, I think the private secretary, I mean, first of all, I think the private office, I mean, I can you speak about obviously our own, you know, but um, is operating hugely efficiently. Um, you know, there is an awful lot of work going on and they are managing and coordinating all of that. I am seeing notes of every meeting, you know, being produced really quickly and coming out to inform people about what has been discussed, what, what the actions are that have been agreed. Um, and, you know, it's actually it proven to you know, be a very efficient operation. And I have obviously, you know, worked in Whitehall and um, what I'm seeing is, you know, is, is a very good uh, set of working. In terms of the role uh, of the permanent secretary, is there a specific role in the Northern Ireland institutions and has it increased since coming back that is managing tensions, tensions or relationships between departments? Is that greater than it would be in Whitehall where you're much more of an accounting officer? Uh, <laughs> I think managing relationships in Whitehall was quite a bit of work. Indeed, but, <laughs> but, but you know, you, in a multi-party executive like here, is there a particular sort of I mean, something distinct about it? There, I mean, there is. I mean, first of all, you know, obviously, I've worked in a two-party coalition um, in Whitehall. This is five parties. Um, so, you know, of course, we, as permanent secretaries, do talk to each other, try to get uh, get agreement, get things, you know, uh, ease, you know, ease through whatever we're trying to do. But it, you know, it's not great. I mean, it works in a quite a similar way. Um, I mean, I work, you know, I've worked in a single party and it was sometimes like working in a two-party coalition. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, it's working well. It would be helpful just in terms of the why, on the, on the question of why legislation is too inflexible, could you set out an example, either or both of you, as to, can you give me an example of where legislation would be too inflexible to deal with a particular situation? Or is that too vague a question? So I suppose, I think one of the interesting ones, and I think we discussed this last week, was around record keeping of you know, meetings. I think you make judgments about the, um, the, length, you know, the length of what you need to do. You sometimes are in a meeting. Um, at the end of the meeting, depending on who it's been with, what the actions are, you may just record the actions, who was there. In other circumstances, you need a much more detailed note. I don't think you can specify for what that you must take a note of the meeting, you must take, record the actions, but I think you need to allow people the flexibility. You know, things are sometimes overtaken, you know, you often sometimes can find yourself in a meeting, actions are discussed and agreed, actually the actions are the further note that comes forward. There is a clause in here about what you must do for a note of a meeting. I think that, you know, I would like to be able to make a judgment about the length and, you know, what needs to be in that note of the meeting. One of the things you mentioned, and I'd like both of your views on this, um, but one of the things you mentioned, Sue, is that in the case of Whitehall, ultimately some of the biggest calls would be made in terms of the conduct of a particular special advisor would be made by the Prime Minister. That would probably be the case, I'm sure it would be the case in um, Dublin, probably the case in Edinburgh, where you've got a single head of government, even if it's a coalition, you have a single head of government um, who is ultimately then, uh, their ultimate point of accountability is through an election. Now, that simply isn't straightforwardly the case here. Doesn't that mean that there is a particular challenge when, you've, when you have the principle of jointery and, as it were, mandatory coalition that you just don't have the built-in accountability mechanism of a, of a, you know, a single head of government who is responsible at the, at, the, at, the, at the end of it to the electorate? Doesn't that mean that, that, that the system here is fundamentally different and that you don't have accountability in the same way? I think arguably it's stronger uh, because a prime minister can make a judgment that this is too much of a hot potato for them to, uh, to maybe in the run-up to an election and they decide to obfuscate or put it to the bottom of the entry and, and not have it dealt with in a way. Uh, here, there is a much more ready access to a set of commissioners who will go off and investigate. And you, you don't require a decision taken by the First and Deputy First Minister. Uh, I mean, they're the subject to the same level of inquiry any of the rest of us are. 
and uh, so I think arguably it's a stronger position than one which relies on the political judgment of a, a head of government who, who may be in a wholly different set of political circumstances that, that influences the exercise of that judgment. And so I think arguably we have a stronger position here. Yeah, and I think the fact that those commissioners, you know, their findings will be published. I mean, you know, to, to have that transparency, I think, is huge. Thanks, Joe. Uh, just looking through the report, um, page after page, you know, the same names jump out at you. And that'll be mentioned here Johnson, Crawford, Brimstone, Cairns. And they come out, and, and I think the sponsor of the bill had said there are breaches of code. So, and some of these people go back to Red Sky. So, those major breaches here. And I just want to ask uh, Sue, in terms of the upgraded and strengthened codes, these type of scenarios arose, how would they be dealt with in the new context? So, um, I, I mean, first of all, I suppose if I, if I think of myself, if, you know, if I was concerned about something, um, I would not be just sitting back worrying about it. I would actually, I think, you know, we would all, in, in, in how we operate in our, in our daily jobs, if you've got a concern, you go and raise it with the individual. You go and talk to the individual, tell them what the concern is. Um, you know, and if it was about a special advisor, talk to the special advisor, talk to the minister. Um, you know, I think the, the strengthened codes then, if, you know, if, if actually action wasn't taken or... If I was worried about, you know, if I felt I couldn't, I don't think I would ever feel that, but if I felt that I couldn't raise a concern, um, then I think you've got provision in both the civil service code and the special, and, the, and under the ministerial code, the enforcement commissioners, to have a route to actually make a complaint. And I think that is really strong, far stronger than from where, you know, where the, in, in other places uh, where they... It's actually, there's not that provision. We've been explicit in the codes about how to do that. Yeah, and you're saying it would be suffice to deal with these yep. types of scenarios that arose in the past? So if, um, you know, if, if a civil servant or anybody actually, you know, externally, because, it, you know, if you if looking at the whistleblower, um, you know, could actually, if they've got concerns, feel they're not dealt with, there is somewhere to go. And the enforcement commissioners, which the five parties um, discussed and agreed, actually have got a timeline for when they complete their investigation. I think it is 21, day, uh, 21 days. First, first stage is within seven, and then the following is um, you know, a further 14 days or something. Um, and their findings are published. I actually think that's, that is a huge thing. And in your experience of the past, uh, of dealing with spads um uh could you give us some sense of um where we're at now in terms of where you would have dealt with spads in the past so what you've got here is a far is a far stronger enforcement mechanism than um than i think in 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 you know in other jurisdictions um i suppose you know in in my you know Special advisors. If I, if ever I have a if I have an issue, I would go and raise it. I, I just want to make one point, uh, Chair. It's interesting that the five parties here had a working group uh, to work up these codes, and there was an agreement on it. Um, I, I get a sense as people begin to talk out of two sides of their mouths here that they weren't at the table, or the party wasn't at the table, or you know, it's it's just interesting to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. But for the sake of clarity, having sat around those uh, sat around those discussions, that's not the discussions I recognise. Can I just? That's a useful point that has been raised by Mr. Lynch. Obviously, if that is correct, then we're wasting our time because the five parties will be whipped ruthlessly to vote against it, even though personally they might be in favour of it. Can you just tell us when did the five parties decide to oppose the bill? Was it before or after the second reading? That's crucial to know. Even with all of the strong support it received in the second reading, did the parties meet after that to say it has to has to be ditched, or was it before? I didn't say anything, but anything having to be ditched. I, I, I took the codes to the 
executive. At that time, we were aware that a private member's bill was in the offing, and the executive were very clear that they felt that this was the way to go, and they didn't feel legislation was the way it to go. It was before the second reading. So, uh, sure, that's a different, that's different <laughs> from saying the executive or the parties within the executive are opposed to it. Mm. That is a completely different thing. Well, as I say, you can square that circle with your own party. I have a very clear recollection of what the views were. But that was before the second reading. Do you think the, your oratory has won them over during the second reading? Uh, no, uh, no, my oratory certainly wouldn't win anybody was over. Was it before the bill was published? Yes, uh, I'm just trying to see when. when I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't recall the, times, the time factors involved in this. I can recall clearly that we were presenting and discussing these codes, and if people had different recollections, they didn't manifest itself in the executive discussion around it because people were largely satisfied with the, the issues that were brought forward and agreed to the codes. And there was also a discussion arose about the idea of legislation. And my clear recollection was that all the parties were agreed that legislation was not required, and that the, the codes the specific and the, legislation. the decision. It, it, my bill. Yes. Wasn't required. Okay. You. Sorry, Gemma. Actually, you'll be relieved to know that all my questions have been answered. But Sue, I just want to get clarity. Did you say this is the strongest code on these islands? It goes further than any. So, it, uh, so I've obviously got a lot of experience yeah. on the um, the code that is in place in GB and in Scotland and Wales because they take the same code and reproduce it. This code goes further than those codes. Right. Yeah, that's all I wanted. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, good. I'm going to start your off. Uh, you. Arish, you're very welcome here today again. Uh, we've become well acquainted uh, on this committee, uh, and again to uh, and we enjoy it. That's we enjoy sure. the opportunity yeah. to talk. And uh, again, to many of the questions that, in a sense, have been answered as well. But I can't help but feel, you know, that uh, once again, you know, that uh, whenever we were looking at and some of the names were propping up, that it seems to be like a culture, we'll say a culture within a particular party, and that as well too, uh, uh, that existed and that possibly is still there. Maybe has to be addressed. Than that party themselves, and I'm not sure, you know, that uh, whether or not the code of conduct, whether uh, 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 in itself, uh, 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 would help to address that issue. But clearly, it's an issue, we say, for a, a particular party, and they're the ones that should be addressed. The code of conduct, and I'm glad to hear too, that there's been uh, reinforced, reinforced from what it was that was uh, in existence. And I'm very glad to hear as well, too, from the Permanent Secretary that you regard it as one of the strongest codes of conduct uh, that you have seen drawn up. Your reputation, in a sense, too, goes before you, that when I was reading a book by a particular author and reporter, he had said that you had been sent over here to clear up the bureaucracy and the likes of it. So, um, quite clearly, um, uh, your contribution there, I'm sure, in many ways has helped uh, strengthen that as well, too. Um, uh, and just uh, your experience now uh, at this current say, point in time uh, in relation to the um, uh, SPADs who are in place and so on, and your relationship in that with them, and uh, how, how would you summarise that? Well, I actually think, um, first of all, I think I would like to say I think the special advisors that are in place are very hard working. Um, I have been struck, you know, I suppose, um, having been here for, I suppose, over, you know, about 20 months without um, an executive and now four months with one, um, they are hardworking, committed, I, you know, are working well, um, you know, I haven't, you know, seen issues that, you know, you have all uh, talked about, you know, which would have been, may have been around before. I haven't seen those. I am seeing people who really want to do the best job they can in very difficult circumstances at the moment. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, Mr. Swan's advice, you know, just doing really, really hard work, working really hard. And our own special advisor, I mean, you know, I actually say to them, you know, is it, they're, they're workers. You want workers. You want people to do their work. And, um, you know, I think the code, the code gives more guidance to them about how to do their job. And I think that's the same for all the codes. They've got a bit of a lock. The three codes are related um, and they overlap. Um, so you pick up things in one code and you pick it up in another. 
and I think that was a very important part of the work that was done by the by the parties. Uh, and through the chair to you, just I think we were all fairly well aware at the time of the RHA inquiry how you had people dancing the head of a pin when they talked about responsibility and accountability, and in particular within this code uh, itself, uh, it very very clearly is identifying the minister uh, that the book stops with the minister. Uh, and that they are both accountable and responsible, or use any word that you like, but in the event of uh, any SPAD not adhering to the code, that the minister is the person that deals with that. I, th I think the, the inquiry in that, and it's probably one of the more memorable exchanges in the inquiry, but the inquiry had a view that that was the case and should have been the case. I think what the code does is make that much more explicit. And also, it probably addresses the issue that others had referred to where. Uh, uh, Statutory Committee of the Assembly found a uh, special adviser had behaved in an inappropriate way and the Minister refused uh, to take action in that regard. The codes now mean that that Minister themselves could be held accountable for that refusal to act. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much, Minister. Thanks very much, Permanent Secretary. Um, I suppose, from I have come in, it's been three years here, we really haven't done a whole lot. In I mean, it's all about faith and trying to restore that faith. And I hear the legislative uh, approach, and I hear that it's done through the regulations that we have here on the code. Uh, I go back to my own time, just a minister with, um, all right to mention her name, Jenny Palmer, who was a councillor with me, and just the personal attack and the way that really affected her health. With what is here and what is imposed, and I'm looking at integrity and honesty and objectivity and all of those which make those cornerstones, this roots it down, this gives us a chance, uh, this code, just to hear you say there as well, Sue, that this is, just to, with Jenna's, Jenna's question, that this is as good as we possibly can get. But we don't want any more Jenny Palmers coming out of this or any more <coughs> guys or the Red Skies. And we want to open. Uh, the, the bit that I, I find is the note taken, uh, you know, uh, all of those note taken that comes out. And it's nailed down, and you can't see any slippage coming through this. By the way, with Mr Alistair's bill, uh, it still will come. There's only the second reading with it. And as you said, Minister, we all have a chance to vote on that. Is, isn't that correct? Am I reading yep. that right? So, well, well, I mean, the, the people here who know the past legislation, it goes on. The second stage yes. is, 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 uh, is the broad principles of the bill, and then it will go on into, obviously, consideration for the consideration. The committee will have a, its view in relation just, to it as well. And then people can ultimately decide whether and you're before. fairly confident that we'll not have any more of the... I mean, but the, the personal attack which happened on uh, Mrs Palmer, uh, you know, that, they have to stop. And you've already said for whistleblowers, Permanent Secretary, <coughs> are you fairly confident that, that will, this will bring all of this to the fore? And we, 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 we'll always have... Maybe I, I don't want any more slippages. I want this really to be built on a strong foundation here for us going forward. Well, the, 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 I mean, so you can answer on the detail that, the, as I said to Mr. Frew, the biggest guarantor uh, of of things being done properly is the behaviour of parties and of individuals within yeah. parties. That's the biggest guarantor. You can you can strengthen all the codes you want. You can yeah. you can argue for legislation if you want, but the guarantor that you won't end up in a situation where people have to be held to account and have to go through that whole process of finding out who said what and who did what and being held to account for that. Yeah. The biggest guarantor is people's personal behaviour, and there is a set of standards expected of people in public life. And if everybody hears that, then the codes yeah. themselves uh, yeah, well, will not become necessary. So that, that, that's the primary yeah. motivator here, I think, for, for all parties that are in the executive and for anybody that's elected this institution is to look at those lessons and say that standard yeah. of behaviour is not acceptable and we all hold ourselves to a higher That's standard. That's how I started that off, just with those four cornerstones, you know, and I know the strongest one, I'm sure for all of us here that are involved in politics, is integrity because that's, that's what makes us probably what we are, but it's just to cement all that and if there is any slippage or any breakage in that, we will catch, this will catch any malpractice out, this will bring it to the fore. So I obviously don't know the case that you're. That's okay. Uh, that's fine. To, but I think if you look at the special, you know, so I don't know the background of him, but the special advisor code actually says, the preparation or dissemination of inappropriate material 
or personal attacks has no part to play in the job of being a special advisor as it has no part to play in the conduct of public life. Any special advisor found to be disseminating inappropriate material will be subject to a disciplinary process that may include I don't know, but you know, I think what you've got in these codes is very clear statements about the standards of behaviour and conduct that we expect, not just for special advisors, but for civil servants and for ministers. And the civil service code has now got an absolutely explicit requirement that we must keep accurate records. That's, it, that's new in, the, in this code. Mm -hmm. Matthew, just a short one, you said? I just want to just further what you just read out soon, really, in the, in the special advisory code. Would you, one of the things that this bill does, and I've had conversations with um, Mr. Alster about it, as we've examined its provisions, is around leaks or official information being leaked of, of different kinds. Um, would you, get, would you, either of you, sort of think that no special advisor has um, leaked any information? I don't, and I don't mean officials necessarily sensitive or market sensitive information, but would it be the case, would it be your expectation that since the institutions were restarted in January, no special advisor from any party has leaked information to a member of the media? Well, I can't say for certain. I know there's an inquiry ongoing into uh, to particular information that, that uh, a particular uh, member of the media got. That's, that's ongoing. If, if, if the inquiry into that is able to find the source of that, then the codes, either should it be civil servants or special advisors or indeed ministers, then the codes would apply. But there's an investigation ongoing into that to find out how that information was received by a particular sector of the media. And if, and if that investigation did find that, that it had been inappropriately leaked, what would be the penalty or what should be the penalty? The penalty should be according to the codes. Yeah, I mean, it, it would, you know, it would, it, obviously, any investigation, whatever you're looking at, there's leaking, you're looking at the, you have to do case by case, look at the individual information that's been leaked. Um, but, you know, depending on the, uh, the seriousness of it, it can lead up to, it could be up to dismissal. Part of the job of special advisors is, of course, briefing the media on behalf of their minister, on behalf of their party, and we need to be realistic about that. Where does the line? Where where do you draw the line in terms of what's appropriate for a special advisor to brief to the media? What information isn't appropriate for a special advisor to give to a to the media? It's also part of the job of the information service within the department is to, is to talk to the media, to talk to journalists. It's not just the special advisor's role. Uh, quite often, if there's a complex piece of proposition being brought forward, or uh, you know, the people in the in the public information side of the department will talk journalists through it so there's a clear understanding of what's been proposed and, and talk to journalists. And that's, a, that's a necessary function of government because government has to communicate and they have to make sure that what they're communicating is understood. Uh, so, of course, uh, I, I think clearly from uh, the lessons uh, that have been learned from RHI, the idea of you know, maliciously undermining someone and undermining another department or uh, you know, leaking information uh, which wasn't part of what the department were intending to do, uh, but to actually undermine what the department were doing would, would clearly come under that. But uh, apart from that one incident in relation to the, uh, that show, and I haven't heard, the investigation hasn't concluded, so we don't know who was responsible or what the motivation was, and it's very hard to make a judgment on that. But it's not just the special advisors that are responsible for talking to journalists. The executive information service and the various people who work in the departments are also responsible for that. I understood and indeed it was my own job not so long ago. Yes, indeed it was, <laughs> yes. Um, and I was aware that, uh, you know, that it's the job of people, to, uh, press officers, people, who, civil servants who work in the communication side to brief about government policy, executive policy here. But we all know as civil servants that information finds itself into the media and the civil servants will say, I don't know how that got there. A special advisor might have leaked it. Now, mm, it is probable that there is a behavioural line, and that line may be permeable, it may not be exact as to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. There are certain things that it may be politically appropriate and acceptable for a special advisor in the executive or a special advisor in any political administration to, to, brief, to, you know, to brief on behalf of their minister that their minister is annoyed about X issue to give that to a political journalist. And that, that, there shouldn't necessarily be anything illegal about that. But where, what I'm trying to get to is, does the code, as it currently stands, set out where, what is, uh, where that becomes inappropriate? 
Well, I think the, the code's very clear about what behaviour is required. If someone alleges that a special adviser has breached that, then it's going to be up to a commission, uh, or in the first instance, a minister, to make a judgment as to whether that has been breached uh, or not, uh, or whether it was justifiable. They always have the civil service code as well. So there, there are judgments attached to the standards set down in the code, and, and I suppose but, that sorry, would be... Minister, there's nothing in the code that refers the actions of a SPAD to the commissioners? No, what I'm no. saying, or to a minister. And if to a minister. The minister yeah. decides about his own SPAD. Uh, and if, if no. that minister has decided what would clearly constitute a breach, but they're not prepared to take any action, they think it was OK, then that minister themselves is saying held um, accountable for And I think the, the, the ministerial code, the, the guidance to ministers, actually says, which is where it goes a bit further, it says that the minister is responsible for the conduct of discipline of a special oh. advisor, which is the same as other codes. It then goes on to say the minister is responsible also for the special advisor's adherence to their own code of conduct. So there is that, there's that, that's where there's a bit of a lock. So if... Uh, there is then, you know, a breach of the code, then that can be referred because it's a breach of the ministerial code. It gets referred then to the Enforcement Commission. My very, final, sorry, yeah. my very final question, Chair, I suppose what I'm trying to get to is, I suppose, to invite either of you to um, reflect on the fact that it may be that what you're, the, the reason that legislation isn't, or your view that legislation isn't appropriate is that once you create legislation, you stop there being room for politics to happen and a certain amount of politics has to happen which involves special advisors briefing off the record to journalists is that that's so i'm just putting that out there is that would that be your view well there is a reference in, in my letter to judgments being, need to be made people need to be able to examine the circumstances that certain things happen i think it's quite clear if if there is a view that that something has been breached and the minister if it's a special advisor in this case and the minister uh, disregards that in some way, then they themselves are subject to an investigation. They will have to account for why they considered uh, what, what would have arguably have been a breach of the Special Advisors Code to be something that they didn't think merited any particular action. And so there is, if you like, that double and triple lock on that. And if they breach the Special Advisor Code, they are civil servants, and therefore there can be complaints to get made as well to the civil service commissioners and but to the internal channels. <laughs> Until you accept, of course, that's all done behind closed doors. The difference with court proceedings is the, sun, the, the antiseptic of sunlight is shone in on the affairs that are going on and the public find out what the SPAD was up to. Well, I, but I think that the Enforcement Commission is going to, you know, they will publish their findings and that will be done within three weeks. Not on the SPAD, on the Minister. But, but, the, but the Minister, if there, if there has been then a... Uh, you know, if, the, if, the, if the special advisor hasn't adhered to the code, that is the minister's responsibility to make them, to ensure they do that. But also, if the civil service commission are involved in investigating a complaint against the special advisor, they also would make their findings. But then you it. have to make the special advisor subject to the civil service disciplinary process. They are subject, which is what to, the bill they are subject to the civil service code, and therefore they come within the. Uh, yes, but if they breach the it, it goes to the minister who appointed them. Uh, without any selection panel or anything else, uh, whereas if they are civil servants, and they are, why shouldn't they be subject to the disciplinary processes of the civil service? They're uniquely appointed by the minister. Yeah, but that doesn't, uh, that doesn't uh, denude them of the requirement to live by the code of the civil service. And if they breach that code, the disciplinary processes of the civil service don't apply to them. The person who, appoint, who handpicked them, him or her, is the only arbiter. Whereas, if they're breaching the civil service code, it should be the civil service processes that deal with them, surely. So I think that you, um, if, if a special advisor breaches the special advisor code, or, you know, I think that there would be a conversation, it depends on what, what that breach is. If it is, for example, you know, there was fraudulent uh, or use of expenses or something, um, but, you know, I think you would, you would do your NICS process. Um, but the, the issue with the, with the civil service process is it normally has a line manager, which assumes it's a civil servant. Yes, but the code could, could be written to adjust to that situation. You could, as this bill suggests, make a SPAD because they are a, special or because they are a civil servant subject to the disciplinary code of the civil service, and then you adjust your code of conduct and your appendices to allow that to happen and you you create 
in terms of perceived independence, a far more saleable proposition that SPADs are appointed, they're civil servants, the independent civil service will look after their discipline rather than the person who handpicked them without having to go through any process of selection will be the person who will look after them in terms of discipline. Just, just for a note of clarification. Yeah, if the person who appointed a... them looks after them as in your pejorative terms, in other words, protects them, as has happened in the, in the past, and you're well aware of the examples, then that person himself is, can be subject to complaint and investigation for that lack of action. Which their own party leader ultimately decides about. Excuse that, me. No that, independence. That's, that's the system that pertained when all you guys were happy enough with it. Uh, sir, sir. I was here. Hold on here, sir. Question. If you are a consultant or a contractor coming into the civil service and you're employed by the Northern Ireland Civil Service on a temporary basis, you're fully subject to all the rules and disciplinary procedures of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which is based on your employment and your contract of employment, i.e. you're being employed by the NICS and paid by the NICS. How is that different from a SPAD? Not appointed by Minister, sir. Sorry. If you're the, so if you are somebody who's in the NICS as a contractor, or, but you're actually, when you're in there, you're in, you're in as a civil servant, you're subject to the code. You have a, you know, there will be a civil service line manager um, who will, um, you know, be the person who will, you know, will be involved in that process. And I think that is the, the, the difference here, that the special advisor doesn't have a civil service line manager. But I can imagine, you know, First of all, I do think... Because it was interesting because you referred to if a SPAD, let's say, had been fiddling travelling yeah. expenses, for example, yeah. they would be taken under the Northern Ireland Civil Service Code. Well, I suppose, I, I suppose I, I think the reason why I think, I think there are different circumstances which may apply in different cases. You may not always have a particular... You, know, you may want to vary your process a little bit. You know, if, if an issue arises with a special advisor... I might go and say, you know, actually, this has happened. Uh, I think we need to either have an investigation or, it's to, you know, whatever it is. But I think you, you know, you will use whichever process, you know, you, you may need to use. Sometimes, it, you know, you might use a bit of a variant of the civil service process if it related to um, a, con a code of conduct, you know, a conduct issue. Um, sometimes you would use the, uh, you know, go and have a conversation with the minister and actually say that person's got to go. I, you know, I think there's, a, there's varying degrees, but I think you need flexibility to um, decide which one to use. And I uh, am saying that, and I am not somebody who would be soft on any of this. You know, I know what I would have to do, um, but there is flexibility, but there is, you know, and I think you need to look at the individual circumstances. Mm. Yeah, sorry, sorry, could I sorry, just... sorry, Jim. Lisa, do you want to say something? No. No, sorry, just, you're just, just nodding at me just then. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Could I just make one, just one point small to one um, So the civil servant who's not a spat and steps out of line yeah. is subject to the full weight of the disciplinary uh, process of the civil service. The civil servant who is a spat and does exactly the same thing is not subject to any of that and his appointing minister is the sole arbiter of the rights and wrongs of what they did. I suppose I see it in that if we're, if we're talking about two similar things that have happened, yeah. and it's a sort of civil, you know, I, I can't think of an issue, um, I think that, you know, you would have, you would have, an, you may have a civil service investigation, mm. and then up to a particular point, the civil service can't take the decision on that. They wouldn't take the decision on that individual because it's the minister who has appointed them. But the civil service would go and talk, tell the minister what they think should happen. Sorry, where does it say in the code that a, a SPAD alleged to have breached the civil service code will be subject to the yes, civil service yes. processes? Well, I'm, I'm saying that I think you would, you would decide on the individual who would code. decide? I think I, if it was if it was me, I think I'd have a conversation with the minister, and you know, or, or sometimes. So you know, you'd have you'd have to say to the minister, who's the sole appointing authority and the sole disciplinary authority, I advise you to ask the civil service to investigate this, and then you can decide whether or not to act on the recommendation. The minister could say, No, I'm not asking them to investigate it. 
There's nothing in the code that compels. Which is what happened in anyone. the past. Which is why but, we're yeah, looking at this. I honestly think that you know we uh, we have got stronger arrangements. Then they can raise that complaint outside of the department yeah. against the minister. Yeah. Not against but, the SPAD. Yeah, but but I mean, then the minister has to defend. Yeah. They're in activity in relation to yes, the SPAD. but you still, Minister, have a civil... You have someone who's a temporary civil servant, supposed to live by the rules of the civil service, yeah. who can defy those rules and get away with it if his minister lets him. No. Whereas if he was a, if he was a full-time civil servant and not a SPAD, he'd be subject to the civil service processes. Well, no, if, surely it comes to the, the minister, territory if, if the you're a civil servant to get subject to his processes. If the minister allows him to defy those rules and get away with it, hmm. then the minister is answerable. Yes, but the spads away in the smoke. Well, then the minister, if the minister prepared to fall on his sword to defend the spad, then that's his or her choice. Happened before? Yeah. Well, I'm not not aware. Of, I've seen cases where ministers have refused to act, and there's no consequence for them yeah. in refusing to act. But in this case, there is a consequence for them in refusing to act. If their party leader thinks. Well, the you know, ultimate let's, authority let's over all, <laughs> ultimate authority over all ministers is those who appoint them. That's been the yeah. case here since 1998. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Just a small one. Small, small, you talk, Minister, about a, a, a breach that's being currently investigated. Now, if it's a live investigation, you may not be able to tell us any detail. But if can I ask, is that from the Department of Finance? No. Our department. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yep, okay. Okay, that's it. Just one sort of small thing before, well, two things. One I'll talk to the Minister about in a second, but just a quick one. So, you said that the private secretary grade's gone up two yeah. grades? Yeah. So, were people who were in the previous post just automatically appointed, of, uh, risen up two extra oh. grades, or did you have an appointment process because there's quite a lengthy sort of recruitment? Uh, yeah, no. So, um, They've gone up two grades, so it would have been staff officer, then you've got DP and grade seven. They are grade sevens. And um, uh, the people that are holding those posts, in, you know, in my, my understanding, is none of them were holding the post previously at the more junior grade. So there has been uh, internal expressions of interest, um, which, you know, which, which were done at the time. Um, Has all this happened since the executives come back up and running? Yeah. So there's been a recruitment process for. Well, I think in some, you know, like so, in, you know, in I think different departments have done it slightly differently, but they not slightly differently, but there has been a process to identify people to undertake the private secretary role. And does the minister make a choice? No. Nope. No. Oh. Nope. Yeah. Okay. No. Thanks very much, Sydney. And sorry. And thanks very much, indeed, Sue, for the rest of it. Sorry. Go ahead, Melissa. It would be remiss of me just. Oh no! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Uh, but could I ask the minister? I know this is maybe unrelated in a sense, but uh, that uh, in relation to self-employed, the whole issue with uh, the uh, Irish passports and Northern Irish tribe licences, has there any development in that recently? You're taking more of a liberty than some of the rest of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have, uh, as we do in regular, uh, we're regularly in touch with both Treasury and HMRC. Sue has spoken to HMRC. Uh, there is. Uh, there was a compatibility issue in terms of their data and the data on the Irish passports, and for some reason there's a compatibility in terms of Northern Ireland driving licences. Uh, they are working to address that compatibility issue. There are other means to get through, aside from pr providing those forms of identification, and there is ultimately a phone discussion uh, service available. It's patchy, I think, is the, the problem with it, so there's work to improve that as well. But we have raised all of these issues, and they assure us that they're working to address them. Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Apologies for being so cheeky. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be cheeky, but I'm not going to apologise. It's the chair who does <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Connor, just a quick one. Gareth Hetherington, lots of discussions going on about sort of rates and where we're going to the rates process as well and the work that's been doing with the University of Ulster. Can we get an early oversight of what's going on in that? Because I think all of us MLAs are getting a lot of questions about what we're doing about continuing the rates holiday or whether we're going to tailor it or whatever it's going to be done. Because some companies are now reaching the point where, despite the increase in the furloughing time, they're, may, they're going to have to start making significant decisions about redundancy. Um, and, and I'm not asking you now, because obviously it's, it's unfair of me to ask you that, but can you give us an, an indication of how far we're getting along with that and when we're likely to see some output well, we, from that? We, uh, we have, we're, we're working on a, on, on a very close to a final draft uh, to bring to the executive. Uh, and what we have said publicly in relation to this is that we wanted to use the initial rates 
relief, which we apply to all businesses. And mm -hmm. you've heard me say this in the Assembly, that about 60% of businesses would not be currently having a rates holiday if we had followed the system that was adopted in England. We, we had it always intended, and we signalled that from early stages, to use that period to get a greater analysis of how the, the pandemic was impacting uh, on certain sections of business as opposed to certain others, and to try, therefore, a clear intention uh, and obviously the executive have to agree this, so this has only been my proposition mm -hmm. and my idea in re relation to this, a clear intention of having a more targeted rate relief for the longer term in relation to sectors which were suffering most and, and which by all analysis uh, such as that undertaken by the University of Ulster would continue to suffer even if they had restrictions lifted. Yeah. Uh, clearly hospitality is going to continue to struggle even if restrictions are lifted just in terms of how they manage people safely within their own uh, businesses. So uh, that, that, that's been the kind of guiding principle that we've had. We have done the analysis, it's been very useful analysis. I think it will serve not just the Department of Finance in terms of rates initiatives, but it will probably economy. Uh, suit yeah. the executive as a whole in terms of economic recovery. Uh, so it's been a useful piece of work in that regard, and we're finalising a paper to bring to the executive, and of course we will share that at the earliest possible stage with the committee. Okay. Sue, Connor, as usual, a pleasure. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, members. And if we have, have we have any other questions uh, in relation to the function and government bill and the evidence provided by the Minister and the Permanent Secretary, could we please forward them to the clerk who will record them and send for a written response? Uh, could I seek your agreement to forward the remaining suggested question in the clerk's paper to the department for a written response? Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Uh, just, just one correction. Go ahead, Jim. It says in the paper that there never has been eight special advisors in the executive office. Well, there has. There has. There has. There has. Mm, Up yeah. until this executive, there, there always, always was eight. Always was eight. It's three well, and one for the juniors no, on each side. In 1999, it was six, and That's then right. the junior ministers asked for five. 2007, they brought in the junior ministers, which made it eight. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, advise member earlier today, members were emailed a link. Did that come through the electronic bell folder? No, I don't think so. Chairman. I think I'll leave that bit out then. Nice. Uh, we will get the electronic bell folder at some stage in the next uh, day or so. We will do that as well. Uh, right, I'll try and get that this evening, but it, do, it does contain a, a, the clause by clause table. It yeah. Be useful to send to the other relevant okay. committees. And I would like your agreement when that comes through, subject to your approval. That we said that on to the other committees in order to support their scrutiny. Are we agreed? Yeah. Great, thank you. There is no chairperson's business, you'll be glad to know. Uh, correspondence, uh, Department of Response, Reclosure of Land Registry Offices, in page 57, and the copy of the Minister's response to the Law Society Northern Land regarding the issue, it's page 60. Mr. Chairman, um, I ask that that be brought forward to this meeting. Today, actually, property sales reopen in GB. Uh -huh in England and then Wales and then eventually Scotland. So therefore we're going to have a situation that I, I don't I don't agree with the response at all. I don't accept the response. Uh, but in similar pandemic situations, our counterparts, the estate agents, the solicitors, etc., will now be able to start convincing in the rest of the UK, but not in Northern Ireland. This could bring the entire housing market to a complete standstill. And I, I understand this issue about the fact that for some reason, unlike the rest of the UK, all this material is held in a paper form in yeah. Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. It hasn't digitised. But what it doesn't stop them doing is putting a, a skeleton staff in on a permanent basis into the office to allow property sales to start again. Because property sales and building is a major factor in the Northern Ireland economy. Mm -hmm. And if this goes on much longer, people are going to stop buy, building houses, buying houses and all the associated furniture, et cetera, that's going to be bought for them. So I, I don't know what we do because I've just decided to lock up shop and go home. But now the situation has changed so radically in GB, I think we need to go back to them and say they need to revisit. May I make a proposal then that we as a committee write to um, LPS again and say, in view of the changes that have happened in the rest of the United Kingdom, are they going to review the situation, and can they give us an um, information on when that situation is likely to be to reviewed? Just for, sorry, Paul. Sorry. Um, Just on that, oh. Chair, I, I don't understand the logic behind land registries' no, 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 no. commencement of work. So they opened again on the 11th of May. It's my understanding that they are only in to do post, and it's only post <coughs> from Royal Mail, not post from outside uh, for from independent solicitors' firms. To me, that's just 
bonkers. I don't know what the logic. That's very right. unparliamentary language. Uh, <laughs> uh, or, 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 uh, but yes, what, it, does, it, does, it, does, it doesn't seem to no, make no. sense. It doesn't make, seem to make sense while well, you would accept a piece of paper or a package from Royal Mail, but not from a solicitor's office. So I think we need to ask them to give us their rationale as to why they're having this incremental opening. Because at the minute, if they're only opening post from the Royal Mail this week, they may as well not be there, really. Because are they going to even respond? Are they even going to be able to process? Are they even going to be able to touch filing systems, paper in their offices? It just doesn't seem to make sense to me. Matthew? Well, my only comment was just a, a point of clarification, a question. Jim. I'm not sure it's all of GB, as I understand the property property law and the property market in England and Wales is one thing, Scotland's completely separate. I don't think the Scottish property market has opened in the same way as England has yet. Y yes, I, I accept that, uh, Matthew, but um, 54 million people in England from today will be able to avail of the Norman conveyancing issues. I think next week is Wales and Scotland have a plan to reopen. We've just shut up shop and because our announcement yesterday was, as you were, we're going to stay in stage one until things change, we're still got a lockdown. Now, the economic consequences of bringing the property market to a halt are enormous in Northern Ireland. I think it's perfectly, I mean, my own view is that it's fine to write to LPS and ask them what their plans are. Yeah. Yes. Can I have a, either Jim or Matthew, can you give me a formal proposal? Certainly, yes. Well, I, 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 I suppose I think it's I, to, to write to the Land and Property Services and ask them uh, their plans for um, their contingency plans in terms of the property market in Northern Ireland and when they, uh, how they are preparing for the reopening of the, of the property market. I think that's a reasonable thing to ask. Jim, you content yeah, with that? Happy enough, yeah. Are we agreed? Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, where are we? Sorry. Uh, uh, so I advise members at page 55 as a lift of correspondence with suggested actions. Uh, speak agreement for the committee for respond as suggested. Right. Content to note the information requested to the department and routine papers issued on the Thursday, the 7th of May. Agreed. Uh, forward work po program. The four members of the updated forward work program for April to July 2020 is at page 89 and is now full. The Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and Sam McBride have agreed to give oral evidence on the bill on the 27th of May 2020. And Felicity Houston on the 3rd of June. Jim, happy with that? Yeah. My, sorry, Chair. If I could just come in the forward work program, and um, I in no way uh, seek to lessen the importance of Jim's bill, which is important that we debate, but I do think it's important that our forward work program is not purely dominated by the functioning of government bill. That's not because the functioning of government bill isn't important, it's because there are lots of other things happening. So it's not that I want that stuff squeezed out, it's that I think our agenda should be we should be thinking about now and possibly we should put in the agenda for a discussion at the next meeting what are our urgent hearings in terms of economic recovery um jim has been asked asked a very pertinent question about lps and and i don't know if we're going to discuss the response from uh, well the economy to, committee did, didn't respond to us on joint hearings but i think we should be thinking on a more in a more front-footed way uh, about if, if we just wait until i finish okay. the rest of my briefing Matthew, okay. just, just hold, <laughs> just hold, your, hold them. Um, I'd like to inform members of research and information service have been asked to give oral evidence on the research briefing paper in the Functioning Government Bill and Strategic Policy Reform Division on the 17th of June. I'd like to seek agreement to bring the in-year monitoring guidelines received from the Department to the Committee next week and schedule into the forward work program oral evidence from departments from the Department of Finance, which I think is very important, particularly as we work at the next, uh, the next uh, bill. Uh, the Finance Division, bring it forward to the Finance Division on the 3rd of June and Public Spending Director on the 24th of June. I'd like you to seek for agreement for the Clerk to work with RAIS to develop a standard line of questions to be issued to all committees seeking a response from departments in line for the oral evidence sessions that same week. We seem to have done quite well in that and I think I would like to continue with that. Agreed? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, seek agreement to forward the in-year monitoring guidelines to other statutory committees. I think we agreed to that. Uh, and sort of referring to what Matthew was uh, talking about, at uh, last week's meeting during the evidence session on the rates uh, subordinates legislation, uh, the official referred to a piece of work being undertaken by the University of Ulster, reference tailoring rates. Uh, the clerk has followed up with this and has learned that a draft report is with the minister, as we've, uh, is with the minister at the moment, consideration by the executive. 
I would like your agreement to write to Gareth Hetherington, head of uh, the Ulster University EPC, to receive oral evidence on the report once it's been finalised, which I think speaks to uh, what Matthew was talking about. Are we agreed on that? Agreed. Yeah. I seek agreement to ask the Department to provide oral evidence to the Committee on the options and proposals it is considering for tailing rate support following the evidence session with them. And I would also like the proposal to talk directly to the Economy Committee and proposing that we look at this because rates is just is an issue for economy as well as finance. Are we agreed? I, I agreed. Agreed. Well, I agree from my perspective, uh, Chair. But I, I wonder if there's a way of framing our correspondence where I think so. The reason why we keep talking about rates is that it's one of the only fiscal Trump levers. Stimulus. It's one of the only revenue raisers that we have on a devolved basis. To be fair to the Finance Minister, uh, as he said, it's one of the few things that, that, that he has. It's also proven that non-domestic rates is one of the, frankly, one of the few politically acceptable uh, things to just to keep raising. We're in a d difficult situation in Northern Ireland because non-domestic rates is the thing which it literally sits like a dead weight on top of the sectors which are hardest hit by COVID. So it's a long-winded way of saying we're not in a position where the startling truth is that these two bits, the one bit of revenue raising we have and an economic crisis are completely interlinked and we need to, our response needs to be linked up. Um, so I think that's why we need to be really working hand in glove with, with the economy committee. And that includes thinking about um, other forms of revenue raising. We talked about fiscal council, other forms of revenue raising that aren't, um, that are, if we, if you like, less disadvantageous to basically small business. Um, yeah, can I also uh, agreeing with Matthew, I think we as a committee at some stage are going to have to take a position on whether we believe that the DFP should extend the rates relief for a further three months. Um, we, the, all the businesses that have contacted me have availed of the furlough and they've availed of either the 10,000 or the 25,000 grant. But if this crisis is going to continue, I don't think they're going to be in a position in July to pay commercial rates for three months. I don't mm. think they are. You know, and uh, just on that, folks, I mean, I'm sure all of us have, we've been made aware of, of the problems, and the Minister brought it up there in the hospitality sector. I mean, three months' rates, it's, it's no good. They have no form of income coming in here anymore. They probably won't be getting a form of income for another year. These businesses have no way of trying, or they're now seriously thinking. They themselves have no option. They will not reopen. They need help now, folks, and three months even isn't enough for them. And those that are over 51,000 of NAV, uh, Jim, are, are, are find themselves with no, no grant aid. Uh, they can take a loan. One business spoke to me last night. It's not to bore you, but to tell you the hardship that they find themselves in. They've went for the 50,000 pound loan uh, that's been given to them, and they have went to their bank and got a £35,000 overdraft. That's £85,000 worth of debt that they never have had before, or never thought that at these advanced years of their business, when they've had everything paid off, that they'd have to go back into debt. And that's just to try to see can they keep themselves there or thereabouts for the next two years. Now, if we lose these businesses, it will affect our tourism because we will find that that product for the visitor to come here to Northern Ireland, I spoke of it before, uh, they're shut down for them. That good feel, hospitality fact, uh, sector will be gone. They may well be filled, those premises may well be filled in the future, but they will not be filled with the same type of operators that we have now that gives good old decent Ulster hospitality. And we need to maintain them and we need to look after them. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Pat. Uh, Tim, are we content with the degree the forward work programme as it currently sits? Okay, Agreed. Sir, are members content to bring the uh, strategic plan next week? Uh, sorry, are we content to bring the did I miss that? Are we content to bring the strategic plan at, up at next week's meeting? Yeah. Agreed. Uh, any other business? Yes. Yeah, I could raise one issue. Uh, it may be small t in some ways, but for people it's having a massive impact. People who work in the civil service and who are trying to get mortgages are finding that they cannot obtain their uh, pay slips uh, because HR support aren't, aren't issuing them <coughs> for April and are going to continue not issuing them uh, for the foreseeable future. 
So if we could write just to see and require and Sorry, just for clarification, these are hard copy pay slips or are they getting pay slips electronically? I don't know that they're getting anything. Uh, and but that we, means we then get the electronic. Mm. We get electronic yeah. ones. Uh, so, so I, I'm led to believe that they, they aren't getting anything. Well, sometimes the state agents demand hard copies, and not not internet copies. That's the problem. They demand real copies. And so when then you go to the, your bank or your mortgage provider, they won't issue your mortgage, and you have a window of say ten days, some have twelve, whereby then that that's your window, that's their window of assessment, and then the whole thing falls, and you have to ask for a complete recall of a mortgage requ uh, request. So there seems to be an issue where civil service uh, civil servants aren't obtaining that information they require to progress a mortgage i'm wondering if we could write to hr support just to see what the position is uh, maybe may i make a suggestion paul as you as an mla write well, the uh, hr yeah. support first and depending on the response you get yeah, from them bring it back to this committee and i think that would probably be the the way to do it and escalate it above it because i, I must admit i would find that surprising but then I've been surprised before. Any other business? Yes. Sorry, Jim. Um, I got two answers recently from the minister that I think that there might be merit in the committee taking interest in. I asked about the disciplinary process arising from RHI, and I asked about civil servants who might retire. And I was advised that there is a process which will be undertaking where people will review their actions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But anyone who's retired uh, before the process completes is untouchable. So I think that, from a public perception point of view, is problematic, because if civil servants were criticised by Lord Justice Cochrane and they can duck out of the way by retiring, well, then it's not a very healthy situation. Um, what's, your, what's your proposal, Jim? Well, I was going to ask the clerk to look at the two, questions, the two answers, 3848 and 49, and maybe write to the department uh, inquiring about what stage any investigative independent panel have got to, and inquire, is it not possible if someone's subject to investigation before they retire, that that process is completed and can't be aborted by, by merely retiring? But I cannot see how, if there's an ongoing process, just by the fact that you've retired, the process stops. Well, the question was who, uh, how relevant civil servants who retire over the coming months will be made amenable in respect of disciplinary matters arising from the RHI report. The answer, no civil servant can be disciplined after they cease to be a civil servant employee. Therefore, no disciplinary action can be completed in respect of any civil servant after their retirement date. Mm, I think we need clarification on that. So I think we'd want yeah. to yeah. say that. Sorry, Pat, sorry. Uh, th thanks, Chair. And I was wondering, I, I, I've been trying to find a little bit of information, not just from the Minister himself, but it's to do with public contracts. And uh, I believe there was a paper issued. I can't find it. I've looked everywhere which is possible for it, about the provision of relief to contracting bodies on existing contracts. This includes the cost of PPE and social distancing measures. I have looked everywhere. I can't find it, and I was wondering would it be possible if, that, if we could ask for that to to be forwarded on to us? I have asked as a private individual, uh, as an MLA. Have you asked I can't as an MLA? It. Yes, and you I can't get a response. It. No. And it's pertinent, you believe, to the finance committee's work. I believe. I believe uh, it is. It's very important to us because this brings us on to the recovery, which has already been spoken of by Matthew and by ourselves. So we need to know. You know, what, where is the line on those? I mean, the, 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 it's going to be driven by ourselves and public bodies. Do you know on contracts? Are we content? I'm, I'm not clear. It's just a, a, it's information relating to the contracting bodies on existing contracts, so to the sums that's there for it. I think that it's important 
that we, we, we at least see the, the paper. It's nothing big. There's nothing big in this at all. This is just that they're thinking about this and how we're going to come out of this and what way it ties down to those that find themselves in contracts going forward. Because this is the only way that we're going to move out of this. is going to be very uh, uh, just, just, I think the best avenue for it is to put, put in a written question to them. I've done that twice. And you still haven't had a No response? answers there from it. And I've sent it to the Department of the Economy as well. I will do it again, but I thought that no, I, no, I could no, ask through, interpre- through which, the finance here to help. Brought, which minister brought this forward? Which minister brought it forward? Uh, come from the Minister of Finance. Both? From his department. Not, an economy wasn't mentioned with it, but mm. I, I thought it might have been cross cutting and they might have been aware of it. Right, okay. Yep. Okay, it's, nothing, it's nothing huge. It's just a bit of help to find a little bit of information. Okay. Well, this should be done in a second. It came from the Minister. Yeah, okay. okay. Any other business? Are we any further with the NCA? I, I haven't heard anything back from the NCA at this stage, no. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed thank for you. your attendance today, and we'll see each other uh, next Wednesday at uh, 2.30. Thank yes. you very much indeed. Thank you. thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.